So my name is Manu Ferrari. I'm from Money and Chain. I'm going to talk about building financial products on top of Bitcoin. That is what we are doing. Um, what 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 is the problem with the with the traditional financial system that it excludes many people in the world? But I don't need to explain you this to you. You you know. Uh, this is uh, from yesterday. This is Silo uh, talking about the uh, devaluation in Argentina. This is all over the world. Uh, one of the countries that, that are always speaking about inflation and devaluation and crisis is one is Argentina, one is Venezuela, and the other one is Zimbabwe. Actually, we focus right now, and most of our users, the stablecoin users of finance chain, are based there, are, are people that really need this. For, for for their their daily life. So let me tell you very shortly about me. I'm Argentine, obviously. Uh, I've been born in Italy, but I'm I've been raised in, 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 in Argentina. And my my real story. I I live in my childhood in high inflation context with high inflation. I remember going to a grocery that the money that my father gave, gave me was not enough. I need to come back to, to ask for man, more money. I went back to the grocery. Again, the money wasn't enough to pay for the food that I wanted to buy. I had to go back and go again. So three times to buy something because the prices were increasing so high in the same day. That, that's my personal experience, and I lived that. So I, I know what is hyperinflation. And just for, 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 for you to understand the context that, for example, we are living in the last 20, 20 years, inflation in Argentina, the average, was more than 25%, okay? And per, per year, 2% uh, per month, average. But, for example, this year, this is official inflation. It's like the official inflation in the United States. It's, it's fake. It's much higher. No, but this is expected. The, 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 what the National Institute of Statistics <laughs> says that it's going to do it. Uh, it's much, much higher. You, you, you got that. And this is the, the price of the dollar. So, which is the price of the dollar? You, you can choose one. And here you have seven prices. Actually, it's the price of the pesos. You don't know which is the price of the of your currency. Actually, you have if, if you are if you want to use or you can use this is the official rate. This is the informal rate. This is the rate for tourism. This is for for doing transactions in in the stock exchange. This is the crypto, the the USDT rate. This is uh, if you are a bank. And this is if you are trading bonds. And actually, there is like 50 rates. <coughs> and depending who you know in the government or how you deal, you can have different uh, uh, price for, for, for the pesos. Okay? So th this is the context of Argentina. This is the context in Zimbabwe. This is the context in Lebanon. This is, I don't know how it's now in Turkey, but most probably it's, And most probably it will be in many, many countries, most most people in the world live in this kind of context, okay? In Argentina only is more than 50 million people, okay? <clears throat> so, when, I, I'm not going to explain you why Bitcoin, you, you know, but for me as a Bitcoiner, I, I before explaining about, about the stablecoin that we built, I need to explain what, what is important for me as a Bitcoiner. For me, Bitcoin is important because it's peer-to-peer. -peer. I don't need someone in the middle. I don't. It is decentralized. The government cannot come and change the rules, and it's censorship resistant. The government cannot go and steal my money. I haven't uh, told you before. This was specification. Anyone knows what is specification? Specification. Well, I know. Specification happens, for example, when you are holding 10 years convertibility in Argentina. You have one peso, one dollar, backed by a law and the central bank. And from one day to another, 
it, it, it had, before that, it has a, a law by the Congress, which uh, said it was intangibilidad de los depósitos, so nobody can touch your money in the bank by the Congress, and after that law, and after the president that said, who had uh, put dollars in their bank account will receive dollars. After that, from that one day to another, it was especificación. Especificación, now you have you have one dollar, well, now you have 1.4 pesos. But when you wanted to, <laughs> to change, uh, it was, uh, the, the, the real rate was two dollars, so 100% uh, devaluation in the, in the real rate. So that is specification. It's still by the government. It's still money from a government, from the state, to the citizens. And it was for everybody having their saving, my, my grandmother, my father, everybody. I, all my, my 10 years of working, I have all my saving there. From one day, day to another, 50% gone. And the other, the, the rest, I couldn't take it out because it was, well, it's not here, it was Corralito. So you, you have it in a bank, in Chipre you, you had Corralito. You have it in a bank, but you cannot take your money. So if, if you live in a context like that, this is very important. This, 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 this characteristics of, of Bitcoin is, is really, really important for, for, for surviving. So uh, what, what we wanted to build is a, a stable coin. Fully is called dollar on chain, uh, with that properties, the properties mainly of censorship resistant. Because when we started to, to actually, uh, one of the other co founders of Money on Chain, who is Max Harkusrach, he wanted to build Tether before Tether existed. He's a OG, uh, he, he really been in the space for, for long term, for a long, uh, 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 many, many years. And he wanted to build Tether, but as soon as Tether appeared, he understood that well, that was completely centralized. Tether is a bank at the end. It could be a very good bank or bad bank, but it's a bank. We now have history with banks ends. Normally it ends very bad. And this is a huge bank. So we, we as a Bitcoiner cannot trust any bank. Because as, a, as a Argentines actually cannot trust any man. We cannot trust any institution because institution doesn't work well with it. Actually, I think it doesn't work worldwide. But some, some places work better and some places work worse. But where I live, it, it doesn't work. So we need to, to build a, a stablecoin backed by, by Bitcoin with these trust minimized features as trust minimized as possible. But in order to, to build in that, we realized that we needed uh, Bitcoiners to put the collateral. So for Bitcoiners providing the collateral, the liquidity for someone else to, to, to mint the stablecoin, we invented, this is an invention. You, you, if you look on MakerDAO, MakerDAO model is different to Manian Chain. Manian Chain model is unique. It's an invention from uh, from my partner, from Max Carcusa. So the, there is a the the probability uh, the Bitcoin providing liquidity get a, another token which is called Bitro. So to explain the model very very easily, I'm going to explain very shortly. I, uh, maybe some of you, I think most of you will understand it. Suppose that me and Joshua uh, are going to put Bitcoin inside the protocol. Okay. And Joshua wants uh, a stablecoin, I'm a Bitcoiner that wants to provide liquidity. Now the price of Bitcoin is one dollar, one Bitcoin, okay? He puts uh, one, one Bitcoin, so it's one dollar. I put three Bitcoins, it's over collateralized. There is always much more Bitcoins uh, as collateral than the, the stablecoin issue. So I put three Bitcoins and I get three big gross, okay? So if the price of Bitcoin now goes up 100%, the price of Bitcoin, the, 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 the Bitcoin needed for, for covering this telecom, only one dollar, will be half, okay? Half of 0.5. Oh, 
So what happens with that half a beacon that he leaves in the table? It comes to me. Okay, so basically, if the price of Bitcoin goes up, the people providing the liquidity takes the Bitcoin from the uh, stablecoin holders. And if the price of Bitcoin goes down, suppose instead of going from one to two, goes from one to half, half a cent, uh, sorry, half a cent, no, half a dollar, now I, I will have, instead of three Bitcoins, I will have two point, uh, Sorry, two bitcoins, and he will have two bitcoins, okay? And I will have lost one bitcoin at forever. And you will say, okay, but that is very risky for bitcoin holders. Well, the reality is that this is highly over collateralized. For example, right now, it, it is six dollars in bitcoin for each dollar chain that is minted. So it's, it's highly uh, uh, over collateralized. And then we also have this third actor that I did not explain about. This third actor is leverage traders that, for example, the, the people that trade long operations in, in BitMEX, with Phoenix, whatever, but they don't want to put the Bitcoins in a centralized exchange and they want to have a trust minimized way to do uh, leverage trading. So these guys can take part of the leverage from the Bipro and they pay an interest rate. So at the end, the Bipro is a token with some leverage, not so high, normally it is 1.1, so typically if the price of Bitcoin goes up 50%, the price of Bipro will go up 55% and vice versa. So it's low leverage plus a passive income, okay? And on top of that, it, it gets also part of the, there is a liquidity mining on the, on, on the governance token. The, the governance token is another uh, piece of the protocol. This is actually very, very big. Uh, this being launched in December 2019. Then we, we, we were building, meanwhile, this governance. This governance is why we, we build this token and why we build that smart contract to make it Trust, as trust minimized as possible. So now, if there, we want to make a new version or make a change in the protocol, the people owning this token can vote for uh, for any any change. Similar to MakerDAO and other, and other protocols that work. Okay, it's similar. It's, it also, we build a different governance uh, protocol to, to the other ones that, that were working. And when we launch on our scale. All this is, I didn't explain, sorry, all this is running on top of RSK, which is a Bitcoin sidechain, okay? How, how many of you know about RSK? Okay, most of you, for the, the ones that don't know, RSK is a Bitcoin sidechain. If Bitcoin doesn't work, RSK doesn't work. And while Bitcoin works, forever it's going to work. And it's, uh, it's a high synergy with, with Bitcoin because each transaction, for example, if, if you want to mint the dollar and chain or the Bipro, you need to pay a, a, a small fee, a transaction fee, and that fee are earned by the Bitcoin miners, okay? Uh, so, so there is a synergy. Actually, one of the biggest problems that everybody talks about is what is going to happen with Bitcoin when there is no subsidy? Okay, one of the things that could happen is that a lot of these protocols, money and chain, um, Joshua protocol, if it launches in, in, in a Bitcoin sidechain or any protocol running on top of these sidechains, will provide security for Bitcoin, okay? Because they, they will add more, more money for, for Bitcoin miners. It, and it uses the same uh, ball. So, going back to the, to the to explaining the protocol, we, we, there was no chain link when we launched there. We needed the price of Bitcoin. Uh, in the protocol, so we, we developed some oracles. This takes the price of Bitcoin from, from the most the biggest exchange in the world and, and provides to the protocol the price of Bitcoin. That's one of the problems that any of this kind of protocol has is the oracle problem. It needs to take uh, the price from somewhere. And it also, there was no decentralized exchange and we needed a centralized exchange, so it, it also has a decentralized exchange in the, in the 
I'm running out of battery. Okay. Um, so I'm going to pass this. So dollar chain is simply like a Bitcoin but stable. Oh, that's the main object. The main objective is to have uh, not mm, a trust minimized as much trust minimized stable coin as possible. Okay. So the problem with Tether from our or USDC or any of these stable coins is that it has as uh, a bank account at the end. It has it has someone that manages. This is all contained, self-contained, in a Bitcoin sidechain. And while Bitcoin runs and while ERSK runs, and if nobody make a change, and if the protocol is OK, this is going to run forever and cannot be turned off. OK? It's like similar to Bitcoin. It's protected by Bitcoin miners. That's, that's like the main idea, is to be censorship, uh, to have a, a stable censorship system for people living in, in places like Argentina, in Venezuela, or whatever. If you are a, a tracker in Canada, <laughs> maybe you need this stable coin. Okay? Um, what enabled this, this, this actually was, uh, if someone have a, a Mac, because I forgot my, my charger, I'm going to run Is it, is it Mac side? Yes. I'm going to, this is going to die. Uh, I'm going to try it anyway. But what what is going to, this is what we presented that was going to enable, actually when we started this, MakerDAO was not known. And we were talking about that this was going to enable saving alternative for people in, all over the world with crypto. Actually, Stevecom when we started was, the market cap of data was like one, 1,000, I think it's, it was like 1,000 half, half, uh, 1.5 thousand. So it was very small at, at the beginning of, uh, and DeFi at the beginning of 2018, and DeFi didn't exist at that moment. Compound didn't exist when we started. They, all, they, they existed, but nobody know about it. So. And we said that all these things were going to be able to, to be done with Bitcoin, with Bitcoin, with a Bitcoin stablecoin. So if we flash forward, I already explained the, the, the Bitcoin, so I'm going to pass this. Yes, but I, I have a cable, I have a cable. So, sorry, sorry for that, I, I, one minute. If it run out, it run out. Yeah. Anyway, um, I already explained this. This is the performance of the Vipro in the last two years uh, since we launched. The idea of the Vipro that I explained before that I was holding, I was holding Bitcoin and and with a little bit of levers and. <clears throat> It's in time when the price of Bitcoin goes up, this leverage provides more Bitcoins to the liquidity providers and also the interest paid by the BTCX and also it gets part of the fees of the protocol. Well, after two years of being running this, right now it's like 20% on top of Bitcoin. So if you have, if you have provided one Bitcoin uh, when we launch it, now you will have like 1.18 Bitcoins. This went up up to 30%. After the crash, it went down. That is expected. In the in the in a, in a crash, the price of the Vipro goes down faster. But it's mainly thought this token for holders. If you are if you have some bitcoins that you are not going to touch for the next four years because you are holding, well, the idea is you provide liquidity for this. You don't need to be trading this. The protocol is trading this. Okay, and how is trading this? This is providing liquidity for the e issuers of the stablecoin. You can use it also like Bitcoin. Okay, you, you, it's a token. You can go and buy something or put it as collateral in, in a protocol. It's, it's a token. 
okay? Um, but always people ask us before, well, what will happen in a bear market? Everybody is going to, to sell the Bipro because they know that the price of Bitcoin is going to go down. But who knows when a bear market is going to start? Who Bitcoiners does? And when the bear market starts, what, the, what do the Bitcoiners? What do you do when an, you are in a, in a bear market? Right. <laughs> buy, <laughs> buy, pray, I mean, uh, pray, <laughs> pray, <laughs> I buy, <laughs> I buy, and if I have Bitcoin with free leverage, a small free leverage that with very low risk of liquidation, well, I buy more. And actually, I, I, you can go to our web page, this is part of the performance page, you will see the, the increase in, in the total value lock. During this crash, other protocols went down. Uh, this is very small, actually, it's only uh, 2,500 bitcoins in the protocol. Uh, but this is growing organically since we launched it. And during the crash, actually, in the crash, the bear, this bear market is still increasing. So there is adoption and people holding this liquidity is providing more liquidity. And people is bitcoins, right? So, this is very briefly, I have very short time, but we are, I'm going to do a workshop uh, this afternoon that I invite everyone. About the future of Mayan Chain, we plan the, to, to, to move the DAP to IP, IPFS in this year, so to, to make it more self-social resistant. And we are launching a uh, multi currency. Now it has only US dollar per stablecoin. The multi currency will have peso mexican on chain, uh, uh, euro on chain, one on chain, whatever uh, need. Actually, part of our uh, users are mainly from Spain. Uh, not because we track them, because <laughs> they tell us, and I know some, uh, I suppose we don't track this, no, no customer, no, no nothing. And they've been asking, a lot of our users have been asking for the Euron chain since we launched. So that's most probably going to be in the next, in, in, in some of the currency, pay currency that we are going to build. And the idea is to bring all this to Lightning Network. The reality is that the technology right now is, is not there. We cannot build this stuff on Lightning. We would love, but the technology is not there. We are uh, following the advances that Giacomo is doing, for example, with the, 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 their project, and we try to follow all that and try to keep as, as close to them as possible, but the technology is not there. And the, 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 the thing that I'm really hoping this year to happen is Taro. I don't know who knows what is Taro. Taro is a technology that will enable stereocons to run on top of Lightning Network. And while well, we've been talking with Lightning Labs, they, they love the, the dollar chain because it's only Bitcoin as collateral. And, and the idea is that actually they are working with RSK to integrate. So that, that's something that I personally very, very interested in. And, and, that. and regarding the, you remember that slide that talking about all the, the things that you can build once you have a stereo coin on top of Bitcoin. So once you have a stereo coin on top of Bitcoin, you can have a, a decentralized Bitcoin trading and lending, and for example, decentralized borrowing. This is a Latin American also team that is building a, is a fork of Compound with some changes. Who knows who is Compound? Okay, it's one of the biggest protocols. It's a, a money market on top of Ethereum. So where you can lend your, your crypto or your Bitcoin and, or deposit and get an interest. It's huge, it's many billions of dollars. And this is already working on top of Bitcoin, okay? Bitcoin sidechain. So if you have a dollar in Argentina, you can go and make a deposit of 6% in Argentina or whatever in the world. 6% in dollars doesn't exist in Latin America, that, that uh, interest. In any bank in Latin America, you can get that. In Argentina, you cannot buy dollars. Just, it's not allowed. If you are an Argentine, you have pesos, you have to keep the pesos or go to a cave. A cave is a cueva where you are because it's illegal. The government wants you to hold these pesos that is developing by, 
70, 80% per year. And if... Or you know it's good when they force it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, they try, they try. You, you can also deposit, this is the, the interest rate, but up to a, a level. Don't, don't be greedy. I, I would love to put a lot of Bitcoin at 20% uh, fixed. But this is a, a rate for just the first, like, I, I don't know, like $1,000. After that, it's go much, much uh, lower. But you can, for example, in Tropicus, put your Bitcoin, if you are a Bitcoin in Argentina, and you don't want to spend your Bitcoins, you can put your Bitcoin in a, in a non a, 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 a trust minimized protocol, okay? And take a loan on, 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 dollar, on a stable coin, on dollars, at nine point, this is from this morning, okay? I did a picture. So, and this is working now worldwide. But in Latin America, it doesn't exist this rate. If you want to go, if you are an Argentine and you want to take a loan in dollars, you need to pay like 30%. Because, and this is without any bank, nothing. You go and you put your bitcoins and you take a loan at 10%, which is, I know, maybe for you, if you, you live in Europe, you, have, you can mortgage your house, that's great. But if you live in Latin America, there's no mortgages. In Argentina, there is no more, you cannot put your, uh, your house as guarantee for anything because no banks will lend you money. Okay? So, more, more information if you go to moneyonchain.com, you will find the wiki. Um, and then there is many videos uh, that are not charging here. <coughs> But many videos explaining, uh, there is a blog with many articles, uh, or you can join also the Manion Chain community in Telegram. Um, let me see. And remember the workshop, okay? I leave this. Uh, if you want to install the defined wallet, I leave it. This is the QR. We, you, we are going to use a non custodial mobile wallet that is a Bitcoin, an RSK, and many other blockchains. It's an amazing wallet, I use it every day. And they are going to add lightning this this month. Uh, it's been also built by Argentine, an Argentine team. Um, actually, the uh, Bitcoin core developer is the, the person that is leading the, the, the lightning network, uh, adding the lightning network. And the, the only Bitcoin core developer now <laughs> from Argentina. Uh, so, and it's an amazing, an amazing mobile wallet. Not for holding too much money, but as a hot wallet, it's really, really good. Uh, this is a QR if you, where well, you can scan it and to, 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 if you have any doubt how to, to, to do it. But anyway, we are going to do this workshop to, today. So, yeah, at 5 o'clock, no? 5.30. Okay. So the, the people who come, just for you to know, will receive some sats, free sats, you know, like old times in Bitcoin, free sats, and I, you will learn something, okay? So that's all. Okay, thank you very much. So don't forget.
having me here so, and uh, for you for giving me your attention. Um, I'm going to talk today about Bitcoin mining and its impact on urbanization. And I'm just going to start with a few interesting um, examples how people uh, used it in a very creative way. So I'm going straight forward to it and then to my conclusions on that topic. So um, basically, uh, you see a, a wooden trench and Bitcoin mining, and you might think, what does those two things have uh, um, in common? But in fact, there is, for example, um, a Bitcoin mining uh, facility that uh, uses its heat to basically dry the, the wood of local lumberjacks. So they basically put the wood into the um, warehouse that is located next to the facility and uses basically the uh, heat, you know, for uh, heating, the, for, for drying the wood. And uh, it's, show, it's also a very good example that shows what a good um, um, co correlation, basically, the mining facility works with the local population. For example, local population was complaining about uh, about the fact that it was very loud there and they installed a um, facility basically to reduce the noises and invested over 1.8 million euro uh, in uh, noise panels basically that reduced the noise that was being produced there. So it's, uh, it's in fact a very good example of how Bitcoin mining facilities can be integrated into the cities and um, um, create a very uh, interesting uh, synergy, which I'm going to show you more examples uh, uh, like that. And this is nothing new. Um, this is not a new idea, basically, that uh, uh, Bitcoin miners are using the heat uh, uh, for in a very creative way. Even back in 2011, we had strawberries uh, being, uh, uh, dry strawberries being produced with the heat of uh, uh, the first mining machines uh, uh, back at the time. And also when it comes into uh, housing industry or basically uh, uh, ways how we, uh, you can generate even hot water out of uh, mining machines, there are very uh, interesting examples, for example, of an a uh, Siberian uh, entrepreneur, Lyra Folov and Dimitri uh, Tomalov, who developed basically a 20 square meter uh, cottage that is uh, uh, heated and has even uh, hot water uh, due to the fact of uh, two mining machines. I mean, the numbers here are from 2017, that's why it's uh, 430 years still up a month that they will be able, able to generate uh, there as well. And because of the low electricity costs, uh, it's basically another example of a really nice uh, synergy. There is a short video that I'd like to show you. I hope it's going to work and we're going to hear it as well. Сейчас вот в майнинг на эфиром, и люди там э, блок, э, большие блоки, и они просто греют атмосферу. А, а мы, мы говорим, нет, экология, не надо греть атмосферу, надо греть, у нас 9 месяцев отопительный сезон, надо греть свои жилища. И не нужно их, э, словно там, в одном месте всех сгонять, надо наоборот распределенно. Частное домашнее хозяйство, сейчас технологии это позволяет. Yeah, and for example here it's also a very uh, a simple way how based on a Bitmine S9 machine but also other machines could be used so you can generate when you have a Havex system at your house how you can basically use the heat generated by your mining machines basically to also heat up your houses 
or use it in a variety of different ways. There is even a QR code, so if someone is looking for the instruction on how to uh, construct such a thing, then feel free to, uh, to scan it later on. I am willing to send uh, the whole presentation to all the interesting parties, and you can look through that. Um, this is also a very interesting example in Vancouver where basically the uh, uh, city uh, already started to use on a large scale the uh, um, heat that is being produced by uh, the local uh, Bitcoin mining facilities to a very interesting degree and uh, uh, there is a company that was even able to um, develop uh, some kind of, they call it dig uh, digital boilers which is basically a way how they uh, um, maximize the heat generated by the machines for the purpose of the uh, local industry. And here is a very interesting example uh, where a shelter point distillery, basically the, the, the distillery facilities for whiskey, they need a certain temperature and they use, for example, uh, Bitcoin mining machines to generate heat and they put them basically in this turbine that you can see here and this turbine basically uh, accelerates the, the, the generated heat and uh, helps it to, to spread uh, equally over the area where it's needed. Um, here is a short video of uh, one of the founders of it, which I'd like to share with you. I'm excited to announce the sustainable resource winner is Mick Green. They did an amazing job of demonstrating how their technology can provide a sustainable, renewable approach to compute intensive processes. And really a remarkable company. We see all the excitement in the cryptocurrency space and in Bitcoin and all the other coins. Uh, lots of hype, but here's some, some real substance. One of the drawbacks that I think only a, a fraction of the people involved actually appreciate about cryptocurrency is that it is very, very energy intensive. The computing that's required to mine a coin is actually uh, really taxing on a CPU or GPU uh, and really creates a lot of heat. Mint Green takes that previously waste heat away and does something useful in it and they actually produce heat uh, in the form of heat for district energy heating, so heating of large buildings and facilities or industrial processes. Uh, that's, that's a remarkable achievement in a space that is uh, otherwise uh, energy that's just completely wasted. Uh, and uh, uh, so suddenly it's, it's brought green to the, the cryptocurrency space. Uh, it's also great to see that their technology is being deployed, deployed locally in Campbell River uh, towards uh, 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 the process, the industrial process of another local business, the, uh, the Shelter Point Distillery. So uh, just great stuff to see and, and in a local context. We believe that this can be applied through a digital boiler approach to many other industries, including rendering and other compute heavy processes. So a very, very exciting technology approach, which was a result of a team that came together that had a very diverse background, but in particular was aware of and experienced in heat exchange type technology combined with Bitcoin or crypto mining. So it was a, a unique marriage of backgrounds that led to a great invention in terms of technology and an approach to a challenging uh, problem that's facing society. And so very excited to see them step up and become the sustainable resource winner. Yeah, and speaking about that examples, um, we basically see that uh, more and more um, Renewable energy is actually, in general, uh, two-thirds of all the uh, electricity used for Bitcoin mining as, uh, originates basically from renewable energy sources since um, they are, in most cases, uh, subsidized and in areas where there is not really demand for this electricity. 
and uh, because of uh, Bitcoin's decentralized capabilities to basically take this energy, uh, they are a, a, a great uh, a second life for all those uh, um, uh, renewable energies, especially in terms of solar, solar powers that normally would basically uh, die out, uh, but because of uh, 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 Bitcoin mining in general, um, they receive a, a new revenue stream. Um, a very good uh, friend of mine is um, CEO of uh, Poland's uh, biggest uh, uh, solar panel uh, production facility and he basically said that it's uh, over 60% of all the clients just decide to go for solar panels because they are subsidized. So I think governments are creating here a huge problem, but uh, thanks God we have Bitcoin. And I think that it might change it, so be, that they still uh, be able to to fulfill their purpose. And uh, if you consider that basically Bitcoin uh, uh, mining uh, uh, keeps those uh, uh, um, renewable energy sources alive, it also puts Bitcoin into a very interesting position of basically balancing the whole uh, infrastructure of electricity worldwide. Um, El Salvador is, for example, also a very interesting example. I mean, most of you heard about uh, the fact that El Salvador announced uh, Bitcoin as a legal tender there. And, but maybe what uh, less people know is that El Salvador went even further than that. They started to use their geothermal uh, energy sources for the purpose of Bitcoin mining as well. Um, in fact, um, one of the biggest uh, uh, geothermal uh, power plants in El Salvador is basically installed over 300 ASIC machines uh, inside their facility and are using them for mining purposes as well. There is also a, a very nice uh, boutique hotel uh, around the, the Vulcano there which is also heated by the uh, mining power of mining machines that the owner of the boutique hotel basically installed. Uh, in his facility, and those examples, uh, they they spread and uh, and basically change also a little bit of uh, a strange uh, uh, propaganda that is being spread uh, as Bitcoin mining would be uh, in some way bad for the environment. In fact, these are examples that show how excellent uh, Bitcoin mining is for the environment and what kind of great uh, opportunities uh, it has to offer. Well, and here I'm going to share with you now uh, some, uh, some thoughts uh, combined with uh, those uh, examples that I named before. And um, if you think of uh, them basically uh, now having an energy source in the middle of nowhere, let's say there is a power, uh, there is a waterfall in the Amazonas and someone simply decides to establish a, a water power plant there, and he uh, realizes that he has uh, constant demand in terms of the produced energy there if he would install a mining facility. And let's assume, for example, that he would like to cool it also with the water that he has. Uh, we come to a point where, because of having a satellite internet connection, uh, a running um, power facility, and uh, the fact that he also has hot water, uh, uh, it's uh, just a question of time where, for example, a boutique hotel would uh, realize that it's a great opportunity and it just needs to pay more for the electricity as uh, the uh, mining basically pays off. And when he keeps it in a good balance, he could also use on top the generated heat for the uh, uh, purpose of heating up the hotel or for the purpose of, um, of hot water there. And uh, so, um, thinking of that, I think it's just the beginning where we will see more and more examples like that, how uh, uh, Bitcoin mining, in fact, uh, uh, starts to, already started to influence urbanization, how we know it, uh, uh, from a completely uh, different, uh, different angle. And... Um, we also have more and more cases of uh, uh, 
power facilities that are being taken over by uh, mining companies. This is, for example, a good example of a power facility that would otherwise uh, 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 be demolished, but uh, was bought by a mining company. And um, I'm going to share with you another uh, short video about this uh, mining facility. On the shores of Seneca Lake, a retired power plant has reawakened, now pumping out half a billion pounds of CO2 a year. Not because this community needs electricity. Its main purpose? Powering thousands of computers 24-7. Mining Bitcoin, a virtual currency creating real-world risks. Burn more fossil fuels in the middle of climate change to make fake money? It's, it's <laughs> Those people didn't understand it, yeah. Air protection to shield the deafening roar. The Greenwich power plant shut down permanently in 2011 because there just wasn't the demand. But Bitcoin mining has given it new life. Now companies across the country are looking at doing the same thing. A private equity firm bought the dormant coal plant in 2014, converting it to natural gas, installing nearly 10,000 computers, and growing. Bitcoin is all digital. There's no bank, no government printing money. Instead, high-powered computers solve complex puzzles to verify Bitcoin transactions. When they do, they also earn Bitcoins. That's called Bitcoin mining, and it devours huge amounts of electricity, more than entire countries like Argentina and Sweden. But we do not need to pollute this lake for Bitcoin. We don't all need Bitcoin. An intake pipe two football fields long cools the 70-year-old turbines with about 100 million gallons of water a day drawn from the lake. The superheated water is discharged into a river, raising fears about the fragile trout and harmful algae blooms. But CEO Jeff Kurtz says Greenwich is carbon neutral because it buys credits to offset its emissions. The plant's been operating for 80 years, and the environmental <clears throat> impact of the plant has never been better. Kurt told us the plant does provide some power to the grid for local homes and businesses. But Greenwich has big plans to ramp up, to mine 26 times as much Bitcoin, taking over other old power plants. Why should all of this power be going into essentially making money from mining Bitcoin? Well, we think Bitcoin is here to stay, and we really see Greenwich as a model for what the rest of the industry can do. Greenwich tells investors it costs less than $3,000 to mine each Bitcoin. They sell now for close to 33000 a big environmental cost with a huge financial reward. Josh Letterman, NBC News, Seneca Lake, New York. Yeah, of course, we have to distinguish between the propaganda they believe in, in terms of it. And, uh, but what's, what's, what's really uh, an interesting thing is that um, I think it's just about making the people aware of the huge opportunities those mining facilities have to offer. Because let's assume, for example, there is a production facility that needs a huge amount of energy, but not always. Now, uh, when uh, they would cooperate maybe with the local uh, Bitcoin mining facilities, they could basically arrange that um, they are going simply to pay more for the electricity than, than mining power is offering them and use the electricity for the purpose of, uh, of supporting the production facilities. So it's a great example, uh, if we continue to think like that, of an uh, opportunity where a Bitcoin mining facilities can also work like energy storages, basically, because they can easily adjust the electricity they, uh, uh, they use and uh, uh, whether they want to resell it to other facilities. And if we continue on uh, uh, those thoughts, uh, then we actually also come to a point where we realize what kind of huge influence uh, Bitcoin mining facilities probably are going to have in future because they will be in the position to decide whether they are willing to sell, to use the electricity on their own or maybe resell it to the local uh, production facilities or the other industry or the people settling around them, which also starts to put uh, uh, the world uh, uh, infrastructure to a position where they gain more and more uh, power but in a very positive way, because uh, it uh, eliminates basically the government who is manipulating it and uh, and and using it for the benefit of just uh, just uh, 
uh, accredited and chosen uh, industries. And here we have a wonderful case how uh, uh, this uh, could be normalized and uh, where uh, more, uh, more uh, can be done uh, out of it. So basically, in fact, uh, Bitcoin mining seems to be uh, very human in a way that uh, what it needs is what we need as well. And um, I'm looking forward to see more and more uh, great synergies as shown in the examples before where uh, it's more integrated in the cities as we know them nowadays. Um, and uh, as already mentioned, uh, maybe are we going to see more and more uh, completely de uh, um, uh, decentralized uh, 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 boutique hotels being established all around the world uh, in combination with mining facilities uh, established in the uh, uh, next proximity. And what's also very interesting is the thought that um, it's the first time in history where we have uh, energy sources being able to generate uh, immediate gratification with the usage of Bitcoin and mining. And if we think of that, that energy is basically being used to generate Bitcoin, isn't it actually the same as it is done when mining gold? So when we do this transition of thoughts and think of Bitcoin mining and compare it now with what uh, was just shown to you, it's actually pretty obvious how close it is to what a gold mining is. And then um, the question comes up whether Bitcoin might be maybe a kind of antimatter of uh, what uh, gold is, as there are pretty much uh, uh, parallels between those uh, two elements. Um, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward uh, to your questions later. How many of you like this t-shirt? You know the story about this t-shirt? About who, who said this? Samson Group? You know for Samson? You know how? Why he said it? And why I like it? Because Bitcoin is like money. If the government wants to steal my money, just I use Bitcoin. So, fuck you. If the government wants to devaluate my money, Sorry, I use Bitcoin, so fuck you. That's 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 the sh short story, no? Uh, the long story short. And the other thing is, uh, the, the, there is some of these T-shirts uh, in the entrance. If you want to buy it, this will contribute uh, for for the conference. Okay, so if you like it. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> no Come questions. on, guys. Not too shy. That's a question. <laughs> well, coffee break. <laughs> May I ask a question? You. I love my question. So yeah, so I was reading an article on Zero Hedge recently, which was also published, no, originally published in Bitcoin Magazine or something. And it basically, let me just read the headline. Um, the EU's attack on Bitcoin is an English and math comprehension problem. And it says, the nomenclature used to help the layman understand Bitcoin makes lawmakers confuse it as money instead of entries in a database. We must change the terms. So apparently, so, According to them, they're saying that uh, Bitcoin is not quite money because it is like just entries in a database. And it's different with, you know, like 
HTC or something, which is actually backed by um, you know US scholars. So which is entries to a database. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, how would you how would you consider like is it uh, is it is Bitcoin a database? We and you know Bitcoin uh, has value, but just because it has value, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has uh, that it is uh, money. So. Yeah, I'm just I'm just curious what uh, the panelists think about that. So so, so there's there's a definite definition between money and currency, uh, and these this sort of defines of uh, like in the in, in the gold ways it's like intrinsic value, but that's all so sort of very vague. What is intrinsic value? But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, if if I can give you something for your services rendered, um, then that, by definition, is a, is a currency or a money, and it stores the value of that work done in that moment. Of course, some, some stores value or some currency hold that longer, so you can hold it for a week and know that you can pass that value on um, or not. So I don't give a shit what the government says about, oh, it's only this, is it a commodity, is it, yeah, fuck you with your stupid <laughs> bullshit terms. If I can pay someone, for them, their services, then to me, that's money. You know, especially when uh, government realizes the benefits that it has, that it's actually just basically taking uh, things out of their responsibility where they completely uh, lack, especially in terms of how those markets which are mainly dominated by the government, like uh, the uh, uh, power production facilities, uh, and when they see how much more can be actually done out of it, sooner or later they're going to eliminate themselves in the same way as they uh, uh, basically did do, do it now in the financial markets, where it's basically pre-developed for them, uh, and, and they just try to be a, a, a part of it. Uh, where um, regulations are being done for a hat by private companies before governments can even uh, understand it. And I think that over the time you will see more and more uh, uh, situations like that where they basically have to accept that there are structures far superior and structures that can even defend themselves on their own. And that's actually the, 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 the crucial point that Bitcoin itself is able to defend itself on its own because uh, whenever in the past there was private money being produced, it was always uh, destroyed by the whole uh, uh, force of government, like it was, for example, in the in, uh, uh, Netherlands, where they created uh, uh, or tried to uh, uh, emission of a private uh, money within uh, small municipalities, and it was basically de destroyed by the government itself, as the government saw it as like uh, a danger for itself. However, this is the unique opportunity where governments can't destroy it, so they will have to uh, 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 simply uh, 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 synergize with it you know, to a degree that is lowering uh, their influence more and more over time. Yes, I, I agree with both. Uh, I only want to add that the, the, the main reason why Bitcoin has money is because people think that this is something that has value. Any, anything that has value is because it is a, a social, it's a so, social creation, the, the value of things. It's not something that the government says. It's because everybody believes in that. If everybody believes that tomorrow we are going to use salt as money, well, then, then it's salt. If it's, it's, it's gold, it's gold. If, if a lot of people think that... Uh, and, and the best thing about Bitcoin is that Government cannot attack that. At the mo moment that Bitcoin can be attacked by government, Bitcoin is is going to fail as its own purpose. So they can cry harder, as some some people say. Is I, I I don't care. I, I don't give as the, he used good French. I don't talk so so good French. Australian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think 
just the way that that title of that article has been worded is just testament to how confusing the subject of money is. You know, it, as I said at, at the introduction to my talk, you know, most people believe they understand money because we all have to deal with it each and every day. But ultimately, once you start doing a deep dive as to what it actually means and all of the definitions behind it, ultimately the subject has become so incredibly confusing. Even our governments, who are supposedly managing its value for us behind the scenes, don't even understand it properly. And so they can confuse us further by using those sorts of titles in order to bamboozle us into keeping us away from the thing that is ultimately going to destroy their power. Um, but of course, you know, in this day and age, we've got the benefit of the fact that we've got social media, we've got ways of educating people, and ultimately it will be educa education and helping to um, undo some of that misunderstanding, which is what will help people to understand you know, where the values really lie, and um, ultimately it empowers them. Yeah, this seems to be... What I really love about Bitcoin is that, that renaissance of, of discussion uh, about what is money around the dinner table, which disappeared for a very long time. Uh, I would talk to people often back when I was just in the, after 9-11 and I was just getting right into gold and silver space, I was like, I've got money, money, different types of money. <laughs> and I say, say to people, hey, what is money, or where does money come from? And they say, oh, my boss. <laughs> I, they, it's a total disconnect, total disconnect of what money is. And, and Bitcoin allows for that discussion of, well, what is money? So that article, you know, to, saying, well, it's only an entry in a database. Well, you know, you need to enter money into databases. Whatever you choose, you can have it on a stone and put the marks and who this stone belongs to. Or, you, you know, so, yeah, in, interesting that the conversation is coming back. And it's so good because now people on the heels of that talk about what inflation is. Because if you can hide inflation, then you basically hide theft, hide, hide a way to, um, to steal from savers. Yeah, and speaking about uh, the influence of money on society, it's also a good point to mention what uh, Ayn Rand basically said in her money speech. As she defined money being the barometer uh, on society's virtue. And if you consider it the barometer of society virtue and uh, seeing an uprise of a better money, that implicates also an uprise of the virtue within the society. And um, we can just look forward to all the beautiful things that this economy is going to uh, create. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, thanks for your talk. They're really interesting. And, um... Yeah, I think what was just said about kind of discussions of like what is money is like really interesting. And I, what I'm fascinated by with Bitcoin is obviously on the one side, it's sort of seen as like a, a savings tool, like long term store of money, kind of acting as a deflat deflationary asset. But on the other hand, you know, we've heard a lot about talking about enabling trade and sort of this idea of it kind of circulating and kind of building adoption by getting more people to take it as payment. So. What do you see as like the main um, kind of use of Bitcoin, and how do you see those two kind of functions interacting? Because we've got this very like hodl mentality. Do you see there's a potential like kind of danger of people like not circulating their Bitcoin? I just wanted to get your take on that. Well, yes, that is one of the main uh, things that I love to talk with Bitcoin maximalists. It's uh, how you use Bitcoin. There's many many ways to use Bitcoin. You can use it for holding, but if, if you're a Bitcoiner and you're spending money, you are paying, paying your bills or whatever. For example, in Argentina, many, many people use Tether uh, for, for, for savings. For the, they, they get the salary, they go and buy USDT, and they sell the USDT <coughs> to pay the bills or whatever, or for saving, because we are not allowed to use So they are using an, a different kind of, of, of money. It, it's not a currency, it's money. Okay? Um, you can do, you can build, it's actually, we built already one, which is a stablecoin fully backed by Bitcoin. So what can you do with Bitcoin? Everything in the financial system that you see. You can make gold on chain, you can make any derivative that you want, you can build it on, on top of Bitcoin. So you can replicate the actual the trillions on, on the financial market, you can replicate all that on top of Bitcoin. You can do that. So you can use it for your day, daily life. And one of the problems with money is government. Government don't 
need to do anything with money. They just keep security, keep uh, health care, and nothing else. Don't, when they go with money, Argentina, for example, was a great, uh, a great country until they got onto the cent they invented the central bank and they it, we live with the gold standard. The same had been happening slowly, but it's going to be happening much, much faster since the, the 71 uh, with United States and all these fiat countries. Is we will be growing much, much faster. So from my point of view. You can build all financial services, loans. Uh, it's difficult. Maybe not everything can be do on chain and, and fast. And you don't need to do that. I, I, I haven't shown. One of the things there was uh, credit cards, debit, debit cards. I've been paying everything with Bitcoin here, with a visa. That is, uh, I'm paying with Bitcoin. I have a, a, it's like crypto.com. Exactly the same. In Argentina, a lot of people do that. No, I think that's that is an excellent question because obviously part of the problem is you know we've, even in the Bitcoin white paper, Satoshi talked about Bitcoin as a way of avoiding chargebacks on credit cards. You know that was part of his initial idea. So um, the very essence of Bitcoin was about payments. But of course the problem we've got is the technology is not quite ready yet. You know we've we've had a lot of learning about how currencies should work, how they you know even in the 1770s we've got. Adam Smith, who was, you know, observing exactly how it should work and commenting on how it would be ideal in, in the economy. But the trouble is, we haven't had the ideal tool. He was working on the basis of the fact that you were using metals. That then got distorted so that we're using fiat currencies. And so we're now creating this new tool based on our intellectual understanding. But of course, in hyperinflation in the past, people, due to their lack of knowledge, go back to the last thing that they remembered being stable. We're now in a situation where we've got something we're inventing for the future, but very few people are unfamiliar with how it actually works. And so it's going to take time for the technology to, to be developed. And ultimately, I think it's going to be when the workers are demanding Bitcoin in payment, and when the businesses are demanding Bitcoin in payment, you know, that will be the point at which it's circulating in the economy because it's competing, you know, they're competing for their goods and services to be paid for in Bitcoin because they'll finally realize that that's the thing that's going to exchange their value the best. And I think that's the point at which it will be a payment system. But unfortunately, the technology is not quite there yet, even though I think it's getting in place. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I think there's also, we're at the precipice of like bots taking really 99.99% .99 of the internet and talking to each other. Uh, because the the AI, if anyone's looking at Dolly Two and all this, is, like we're literally right now living through the precipice of a of a human evolution through this brain that we've the, this alien that we've invented on here on Earth, and, and and so captures are gone. There's no way to determine if something's human or not, and they uh, they will uh, span. So so and I was talking this the day in my chat. Uh, what will happen? How do you how do you stop bots just talking in your community and <laughs> spamming the hell out? Okay, maybe you have to pay in crypto per post. So you're paying crypto per post to sort of prove a soul, and uh, and and then uh, okay, well the bot needs to pay in crypto now. They need to earn crypto so they can start spamming. So they start advertising them their services as a, as a spam bot, as an automated and uh, earn earn crypto to pay for crypto to spam. So this sort of cycle begins where an economy of bots starts building out. So now crypto is all sort of part of this, uh, and they, you know, bots can't get bank accounts, and uh, and uh, CBDCs and the KYC and stuff. I mean, what the fuck? So uh, so we're we're living right now in a really crazy time of evolution in not only the internet but humans and how we interact with each other, how we know truth, how we know that someone's a human. Uh, it is all is all coming to a space, but. Uh, also, with the, uh, with the Bitcoin, is it money? Is it is it a store of value? Now, this discussion was uh, talked about at nauseum through the blockchain wars. Uh, sorry, the, the the Bitcoin scaling wars, because uh, you know uh, faces that were like like Roger Ver would uh, constantly go on about the velocity of money is important. The velocity <coughs> needs velocity to have value, and and I would agree in a way, but also. Gold, uh, a lot of the time, has just store of value, and it doesn't move. It doesn't have that much velocity, but it stores value. 
but it has aspects to it that Bitcoin doesn't have, like you can make beautiful rings out of it, you can conduct electricity, you can do this sort of things, but Bitcoin has functions that gold doesn't have too. So yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question, um, and I, I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is, but I think what the root, what we're heading towards is having that lightning network. So we have that store value as base, lightning network as currency and movement, uh, and, and the competition of, of all the rest of the layer twos on Ethereum and all this stuff uh, moving forward. I think we're, we're all experimenting on everything, right? I just wanted to add, uh, regarding your, your question of, uh, of she, she was saying that uh, why I understood that maybe cannot scale. I, I think Bitcoin will scale. It's all, already the capacity that it has right now with Lightning Network is amazing. You, you can, I, I went to Salvador. I've been w one week living there, paying everything with Lightning Network because they, they, they have to accept Lightning Network. So, the technology works if you want to live like that. The problem with like the network, the reality, and that's why we built the stablecoin, because when I pay to my my barulero, the grocery, the, the person who sells vegetables in Argentina, I, I try to pay him with like the network, and after two weeks, hey, now I have 30% less. Uh, I don't want to get more Bitcoin. <laughs> so stablecoins are very, very needed uh, for mass adoption. And stablecoin fully backed by Bitcoin, if you are using a, a, a stablecoin fully backed by Bitcoin, you are using Bitcoin again. Um, the main reason, you can use Tether, but the problem with Tether is trust. So uh, the, the problem with any other money, that digital money that you are using is trust. You need to trust your government, and you can't trust your government. I can tell you by my experience. <laughs> well, yes, of course. Oh, you, you can trust your government, or you can trust some... Um, I know Charlie Hawkins or someone else, but uh, I prefer not to trust. No, I, I prefer to trust nobody. Trust less. There's always, there's always trust involved. Yes, trust in immunization. I like the Mixamo term that is trying to, 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 to trust as little as possible. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, I think we finished a little bit early. <laughs> so I would uh, propose we make a small break until uh, 1230.
blue screen of death. So you have a problem. What do you do? Step one, panic. Step two, crash. No. You have to solve a very complex problem while running against the time under stressful situation and high stakes. This situation is called debugging under fire. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. So first, I would like to see how many developers do we have in this room or developers have been developers previously in their past. Can I, can I see the hands? Okay, it looks like half of the rooms are developers. Now I'm wondering if you already know what I'm, I'm, I'm talking about when, when a system is down, right? When, when, when the server is down, when, when something happens, when the, when the altcoin that I'm running is, is down. So who, 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 who knows this feeling that, hey, I have to fix the stuff because things are <laughs> in production. Okay, if, if you haven't encountered this, you're going to at one point in your life. This is, this is, this is something that you have to have experience in. Now, I'm going to talk about, first I, I, I want to give you a context uh, of, of what the mindset that we had that went into releasing Wasabi Wallet 2.0 and then tell you an entertaining, entertaining story about Wasabi Wallet 2.0 first two weeks, which actually involves four cyber attacks. Um, and finally, I'm going to leave you with some practical advice on how to, how to approach the being under fire scenario and, and what to do there. So, first, I'm going to assume that everyone in this room, we have a consensus that a cryptocurrency is going to be the future and it's going to change the world, right? So, next, I want to tell you why I believe that cryptocurrency is going to be most likely Bitcoin. The markets, the free markets, the unmanipulated free markets are prediction machines. And the market capitalization shows that Bitcoin has 40% of all the cryptocurrencies. Which means Bitcoin has a 40% likelihood that Bitcoin is going to be the cryptocurrency that is going to change the verb. 40% is not that good, but, but you have to somehow decide where to allocate your valuable time because you don't want to waste it. And unless you know something that the market doesn't know yet, then you probably want to stick to Bitcoin. So, I'm a developer. Um, I have to build a better money. Um, in order to make Bitcoin better. But what, what does it mean? What, what am I working on here? I need, a, I need a specification, I need requirements. I'm a developer, so this specification and requirements, we can find it in economics. And there are two theories, functions of money, properties of good money. I've been developing this for quite a while now and I map the two theories into each other. The functions of money is unit of account, store of value, medium of exchange. Um, Bitcoin is perfect store of value. Uh, pretty good unit of account? No, not yet. Medium of exchange, it's terrible. Bitcoin is a terrible medium of exchange. So, just, just wanna very quickly go through it because I, I think this is this is my, my map to Bitcoin. This is how I, I understand the context where I am right now. And, and, and hopefully it will help, help you guys too. First of all, unit of account, stability. Um, as things get bigger and bigger, the harder it will be to move them. Store of value, scarcity. Scarcity is a property of good money. Um, that's the single most important innovation that Bitcoin brought. No one can print more. 
security is to account for non-custodial ownerships or hardware wallets. Finally, let's go to medium of exchange. There are some, some properties that Bitcoin is really good at. Divisibility, eight Satoshi, maybe even sub Satoshi thing in Bitcoin is perfect. Programmability. A programmability is to account for Bitcoin scripting language and without programmability, uh, the Ethereum phenomena makes absolutely no sense in the properties of good money theory. So if you don't have programmability there, then Ethereum makes no sense. So I would propose to have that. Cognizability, recognizability, trivial cryptography even makes it better than normal money. Now, acceptability. I want to talk about acceptability and stability in the same, same dimension because as we improve, the remaining properties of good money. As we make the money better, the more people are going to use it, the harder will it be to, to move the price of it. So that's acceptability and stability. It's important to work on that, but working on fixing money, other properties, is just going to naturally result in fixing acceptability and stability too. And this leaves us with portability and fungibility. Portability is about how fast and how cheap you are communicating value to another person. <clears throat> a lot of people are working on portability. Just the Lightning Network itself is a subcategory of portability work, which leaves us with fungibility. Luckily, we have NFTs now, become quite a thing, so now I don't have to... People are not that scared about this, this uh, term anymore, but what is fungibility? Fungibility is uh, also, also sometimes called inter-exchangeability, indistinguishability. It's about two units of currency uh, should be as similar to each other as possible. The only, only variable that should differ are the amounts and, and nothing else, no history for the two currencies that, that makes uh, the coin un, not fungible. So this is also where anonymity and privacy comes in. And I wrote an article about this, this by far the best research article I had. You can, you can search for it, it's called Anonymity, Privacy and Fungibility, creatively. So, the relationship is that anonymity is a mathematical tool that enable that we can use to build privacy of the individual, like with a private Bitcoin wallet, and adoptions of private Bitcoin wallets lead to fungibility of a currency. So it is anonymity leading to privacy, leading to fungibility of a currency. And fungibility is something that not many people are working on because this is the property that the existing tyrannies of the world, the establishment, is afraid the most. If they cannot spy on you, they have a big problem. And that's why I have a target on my head. But that's why working on fungibility, in my opinion, in our opinion, is the most important thing that I can even think about doing right now in this day and age. Because if we fix fungibility of Bitcoin, then we fix Bitcoin and then we fix the world. So that's the mindset that went into, went into releasing the Wasabi Wallet 2.0. So, just a, just a quick quick uh, introduction to Wasabi Wallet 2.0, uh, and let me start with 1.0. In fact, let me start with the history of Bitcoin privacy 101. First, there were centralized mixers. They were able to steal your money, and they were able to de-anonymize you. Then, blockchain infos, shared coin, become a thing, which was not able to steal your money, but was still able to de-anonymize you. Finally, Joy Market came to the, to the rescue, which finally became a, a, a Bitcoin wallet which cannot de-anonymize you and cannot steal your money. 
However, join market was uh, and, and still is a full node. You, uh, you have to use a full node with join market, which means you have to download like a, um, 600 gigabyte in order to start using the, the wallet. Um, that's in 2018, that's when we came out with Wasabi Wallet 1.0, which was not able to de-anonymize you, not able to steal your money, and it was a light wallet. Ever since that, it became the most popular Bitcoin privacy solution. Um, and two years forward in 2020, we finally arrived to the point where we were able to call the system stable. And then we asked the question, what's next? Well, although Wasabi Wallet 1.2 enabled privacy, private usage of Bitcoin, it was still very expensive, very slow, and had a terrible user experience. So, oh, and it had availability issues. You had to use it you have to have 0 0.1 Bitcoin, at least, to, 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 to participate in the Wasabi Wallet 1.0 coin joins. So, we took stock and we started the Wasabi Research Club, where we went through the entire Bitcoin privacy academic literature, reviewed the papers, and, and often invited the authors to, to our reviews. Actually, this is, this is public. Uh, this, many of these conversations are public, so if, if that's, that's what you, you like, you can check them out. Um, so we reviewed the things and we, we, we asked, okay, so what, what can we, we do better, what's the best we can do? And two and a half years later, this is the best we can do. If you look at, look at the screen there, you can see a coin join. A coin join is when many people come together to make a transaction. You can see a coin join here. It's a most people a 2.0 coin join where over 300 inputs and over 400 outputs there are. M most of the outputs are equal. Like there are like five outputs, those are unequal. And to our surprise, most of the inputs become equal. Like we don't even know what that means. But but one thing that we know, and if you know anything about Bitcoin privacy, you can see right away that there is nothing like this existing Bitcoin. This is light years away from everything else. So we made Bitcoin privacy cheaper, faster, and more available. But that's just part one. Part two. What you see here is the most beautiful Bitcoin wallet in existence. No offense. <laughs> <laughs> and there is a good reason for that. Wasabi Wallet 1.2 was built, the UI for Wasabi Wallet 1.2 was built in two weeks by a UI framework developer. But that UI framework developer stick with the project and brought more UI framework developers and maintainers to was something about that 1.1. And as the UI framework called Avalonia, it started to become more and more adopted and going up and up. They 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 picked Wasabi Wallet as their as their primary project to showcase the UI framework its power and, and, and what can can they do with it. So just just for non-developers some context. There is no software project, not just Bitcoin, but no software project can dream of UI framework developers working on their projects. Right? Like that's that's how happy I am about this at least. And this is part two. We improve the user experience um, a lot. So finally, we arrived 2022, June 15. I think it was a month ago, maybe. Um, we released Wasabi Wallet 2.0, and everything went perfectly. I can say this is the smoothest release ever. 
And others kept saying that this is the calm before the storm. And they were right. So we were waiting a few days until people are upgrading and we have sufficient liquidity for, for doing coin joints. And then finally we achieved sufficient liquidity and then this happened. We are experiencing a network-wide DDoS attempt impacting the performance of the Tor network. This is bad. Let, let, let me explain you how bad this is. This is as bad as it gets. <clears throat> that, okay, Tor network. What is the Tor network? The Tor network is an anonymity network that that Wasabi Wallet sends through every single request that it, it does. Now, and the Tor network is under a denial of service attack. But, but, but this doesn't, that still doesn't do justice for it because Wasabi Wallet coin joints are peculiar in a sense that 100 people has to come together and, and make a transaction. And if even a single person decides to not follow the protocol, then that transaction is not happening. We have to start over the thing again. So that's that, that person denial of service attack the protocol. But when the Tor network is under denial of service attack, that means that the, the networking conditions, we get all kinds of strange, crazy exceptions. All hell was breaking loose and, 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 and things were not going through. And it's, it was perfect simulation of what if, instead of one person, many, many people denied of service attacking the Wasabi coin joints all at once. So that's how bad, bad this was. Now, just a quick question. So was this a targeted attack on the wallet? Or no. This was not a targeted attack on our wallet. This was a targeted attack on the Tor anonymity network. Well, well I get there too. <laughs> so we started to work on, started to, debugging under fire started here. We started to work on trying to make things better. We couldn't do too much, but in the meanwhile, we were working on the client side improvements, those actually able to even defend against or at least tolerate a denial of service attack of this, this magnitude on the network. And two weeks later, we, we, we finally arrived to the, to the point where, where we, we are releasing our anti-fragility crack. On Monday, on the previous weekend, we got a denial of service attack on our website. This was no big deal, wouldn't even be worth mentioning by itself. Um, but the CEO of ZK Snacks, uh, the company most developing Wasabi Wallet, and the previous CEOs of ZK Snacks and me got our email account, accounts, personal email accounts, spam attacked. Uh, this was bad. I mean, it's inconvenience, but but uh, but this was bad. We had no idea where it's coming from. Who's attacking? Why? Um, anyway, uh, we were going ahead with the release on Monday, and and I was checking my spam spam pool there on Monday before the release because you know I'm not prioritizing my time correctly, <laughs> and I found an email from the attacker, and he was claiming that. Is going to deny of service attack our website on the weekend. But that's just a warm up. <laughs> the real attack is coming on Monday. Oh fuck. That's not good. That's not good. <laughs> so the real attack was coming on Monday when we were releasing the thing that's supposed to fix everything. Um, well, luckily, the attacker also told us where he's going to. Oh, he was also asking for ransom. We didn't pay. The, the attacker also told us to that he's going where he's going to to to, to attack, and and we reviewed our defenses and we found everything everything in order. But you never know in with these things, right? So so anyhow, went ahead, released the software, and 
and we were preparing with the final crash for the final crash with the attacker. Keeping the watch through the night, I saw the first signs of suspicious activity happening. And then a denial of service attack comes, another one, and we got a bunch of spam attacks, and the developers was shaking on the floor from coffee nowhere, because there was blood everywhere. And I was like, come on bro, this is the Sami! <laughs> I don't know if that ever happened. <laughs> that was much more anticlimactic. Uh, we, we did notice suspicious activity, but couldn't really like decide that was a real attack. So that's how <laughs> debugging under fire for two weeks um, ended up uh, resolving. And finally, I'd like to give you some 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 practical advice of, of what to do here because I've been debugging under fire many times in the past. But these are usually like one hour or a few days, but never two weeks. That's, that's well, one hour and one day is a sprint, but two weeks is a marathon. And you have to pay attention to your sleep quality, sleep management. You have to sleep because if you're not asleep, you are going to have impaired judgment and the last thing you want to have is impaired judgment. Force yourself to relax to sleep. High quality judgment. <clears throat> Second advice is very often what we do as developers, we pair Linux magicians, what we're going to do is that we have a hunch, and we are going to act on that hunch, and we are going to spend an hour to try to figure out if that hunch is relevant or not, and fix the whole system. And after two or three hours, we found that that was not even not even relevant at all, and just wasted our time. We were trying to fix complex problems <laughs> by running against the time, and 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 and. and uh, that's not good. You can't just jump right to the hypothesis. You have to ask questions because you have to realize what the relevant judgments you can make. And asking questions as human beings are the tools for us to that enables us to, to figure out what are the relevant judgments we can make. But if this is too, too abstract for everyone, then let me just give you an example. It's, 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 it's the most common example you can imagine when, when someone is debugging under fire. This is the judgment they have to make, recovery versus understanding. So you guys are familiar with the IT crowd? There is a meme from that, uh, that whenever something goes wrong, the, 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 the developer is asking, the support person is asking, that, have you tried to turn it off and turn it on again? <laughs> <laughs> this is the meme. <laughs> it's, it's funny, but this is the magic algorithm of fixing every single system in existence. <laughs> now, what I want to say here is to take down your, your operator hat for a moment and put on your hacker or developer hat and try to try to catch the bug while it is happening. Try to try to do that. Just try to spend a little bit of time debugging the thing while it is happening because otherwise you are risking of, of, of losing the bug and you're going to be sitting on a ticking time bomb again. And and that's not that. That's not good for your sleep management. <laughs> so, so that's that's it. Try to try to debug before you restart. And how long should it take? That's up for your judgment. And on a final note, debugging under fire 
is a test of your character. It's an opportunity for you to develop your character. If you go into it with the right mindset, it is going to change you. It is going to take you to the next level. And you can, you can come out of such situations stronger than you went into it, rather than weaker. Thank you a lot. In half an hour there will be the Q&A session with you, so don't worry, you can still ask us all questions. And now please welcome Pavel. He's going to talk about the importance of open source. So, hello everyone, my name is Paolo Rusnak, I'm a co-founder of Satoshi Labs, and my talk today is about the importance of open source. Uh, when I first uh, decided that I'm coming to this conference, I really didn't know what level of uh, audience should I expect, like should I make a technical talk or non-technical, but then I realized it's probably better to have a non-technical talk because either you are a non-technical person and this will be good for you or uh, you are a technical person, you are participating in open source a lot but I think it's even for people like you it's important to uh, remind yourself why you are doing stuff in such a way and a little bit about uh, our company uh, we are Satoshi Labs, we are creators of Trezor and we have some other companies under um, our umbrella Unity, Tropic Square and uh, Vexel and I will be talking in this talk about Trezor and Tropic Square later on. Our mission statement is strengthening the power and independence of an individual and we do that via open source projects, which are both hardware and software open source projects. Uh, you probably know what, is, what this is. It's a Bitcoin Core wallet and it's open source. And Satoshi decided to make it open source to make it auditable. So anyone could look inside, that is the link what it's supposed to do anyone could look inside that it doesn't do anything else that it shouldn't be doing. So one of the goal of having stuff open source is auditability. This is Trezor. It's the first hardware wallet. Uh, it was created by Slash and Me in 2012 and 2013. It's uh, available since 2013 and it's fully open source, both hardware and software, since day one. So you can build your own. And it basically started the whole industry of hardware wallets. There are more than 50 direct and indirect clones of Trezor out there. And 
all hardware wallets use the same standards we created, uh, like BIP39 and BIP44. BIP, uh, that really means that if you are unsatisfied for any reason with one hardware wallet, you can get another one and use the seed to transfer your funds to other other wallets. There are many, many software wallets that use the same standard, so you can import your funds into software wallets as well, but I don't really recommend that for a significant amount of savings. So another, I mean, effect of open source is this inspiration uh, for others and also interoperability. Uh, our Another effort of ours is Tropic Square, which we started in uh, 2020. And our goal is nothing less than creating the first open source secure element. So basically the same thing we did with the first open source hardware wallet. We want to create the first open source secure element. And that really hope, uh, we really hope that we, it, this also helps to start a new industry. Because currently, the status quo is security by obscurity. You can't get a secure chip that's open source. Everything is full of patents, intellectual property, obscure. So we are trying to show the whole industry the way that you can actually make chips open, you can make them profitable and so on. But it's, it's, a, it's a long run. So another goal of open source to pro is to provide innovation or even disruption in the industry. Uh, I'll be talking shortly about Electrum as well. Uh, it's one of the first software wallets. Uh, I mean, the first one was obviously Bitcoin Core. And it, uh, it is created by Thomas, who is sitting here. And it's active since uh, 2011, I guess, right? And it's also been fully open source since day, day one, I think so. And it's written in Python. And Python has this really nice property that is very easy to read and understand. And during the very early days of Trezor, we were looking into Electrum code a lot because there was a lot of advanced concepts that we were not able to understand from these academic papers and sometimes it was very hard for us to read the C++ code, which uh, Bitcoin Core was written in. So we were looking in uh, Electrum code, how actually uh, Thomas implemented that in Python, which was very easy to read for us. So open source also has this explanation or education feature as well. Uh, if you are familiar with GitHub, you can look at the <laughs> contributors chart uh, for each project and there are several ways how to do open source. One of them is you just take the code and publish it on GitHub and don't care about anything else. Uh, that's basically what Microsoft thinks is open source. But uh, open source is really about building community. So you are uh, di having discussing, uh, you are having discussions in the open. You are commenting on pull requests, explaining the people that are contributing to your project why their pull request is probably not ideal and what should they change in order to make it well done to be merged into your project, and that way. You, pile, you build a community and maybe a new friendship. And this is perfect opportunity for me to, to visit them, the conferences, and then to meet uh, people in person. I've been in touch on GitHub for several years, and then I could finally meet them and say, yeah, yes, yeah, cool, I know you from, from GitHub, right? Uh, and that's very important for me because, you know, I spend a lot of time with my computers and I'm kind of uh, nerdy and bad at making friends, so that's, that's a nice way how to make friends if you are a person like this. Another is important aspect of open source is reproducibility. There is this website called walletscrutiny.com and what they do is they take 
a lot of uh, basically all of hardware and software wallets and they try to reproduce uh, the binaries or the firmware from source and for most of them it is possible I mean Trezor is reproducible, Electrum is reproducible and others so they were actually able to follow the instructions how to build an executable, installer and firmware and they arrived at the same file as we are distributing. And they can prove, well, yeah, that this code that's published actually leads to the result that company or that project is distributing. There is nothing else. And this is very important in this auditability uh, aspect as well. Because maybe a malicious person could publish regular source code, but then hide the backdoor in the binary. So it's very, very important to have uh, open source reproducible, so reproducibility is also a very important aspect. Another nice example is Bitcoin Takeover magazine by Vlad sitting, sitting there. And uh, what Vlad does is that he, he publishes his magazine as open source and that makes it available in countries or places where he hasn't been yet or maybe the countries are not that rich that can buy the magazine from himself on the website but they can read the PDF, they can even maybe print uh, the PDF so open source is making stuff also available you have much higher reach and then uh, of course you can for example translate it to some languages if if, uh, if uh, the magazine wasn't open, then it would be illegal to make, I don't know, Spanish and French uh, translations of his magazine. So, do you know what, what, what this is? <laughs> yeah, you, you guessed it. It's my uh, kick scooter, electric kick scooter. And what happened to me is that when I, when I bought it, it had a maximum speed limit of 40 kilometers per hour. But then half a year later, they released a firmware update that decreased the speed limit to 25 kilometers per hour. And you know what is this? <laughs> That's not my car, it's just a random picture of a car from the internet. But this is going to happen for cars as well in New York. They, they decided last week that they will implement ISA, Intelligence Speed Assistance. So, what I think that uh, uh, where open source makes a big role in that as well is we have now this world which is becoming more and more depending on technology and this technology is usually in the hands of corporations and governments that uh, they do stuff which is best for you but of course it's not the best for you, so ultimately we should push open source everywhere because open source is the freedom to make decisions, your own decisions. And uh, it's very important uh, to fight for this because uh, freedom and privacy used to be the default, but now we live in society when this uh, stuff is being taken away from us and we have to fight <coughs> to bring it back how it was earlier and open source is one of the ways how to how to do with it. So thank you and if there are any questions then there will be a QA session with me and Anna later.
Some silence, please, for the panel. <coughs> wow, that works. Okay, small applause for our panel here. Vlad Pino, Thomas. Want to talk about NFTs? Yeah. So just for the record, I have some cards here. I'm going to give away a physical NFT to someone who wants it. I have a picture of my face. It's called Vladhead. It's on Counterparty on Bitcoin. It's the biggest shitcoin ever, but someone bought it for $100, and now it has a market cap of like 100 k And that's how you do it. That's how you scam. So who wants to get a scam Counterparty token? You get a scam. And you get a scam. Oh, yeah. And you get my cap space. I've got a Joshua. Do you know Chris the Rose? Yeah. Who knows Chris the Rose? Yeah. Okay, I've got a question. Um, since we're self-moderating, uh, Vlad, uh, card and you Vlad, are you paying uh, Joshua royalties for using the picture of his head? And do, and who owns the IP for the picture of Joshua's head? So if he's not here, he doesn't know about it. It's fine. Okay, that's one. That's one way to do it. Uh, okay, great. I also bribed him, he has like 20% of the supply of tokens. So I was hoping that we could have a debate between whether NFTs are innovation or a scam, but it looks like we're all innovation here, so it's going to be difficult to do that. No, now that I have no shit coins, I can play the bad guy. Like, okay, those so are scams. You just Vlad, scams. Vlad just gave out a scam right here, but let's start with NFTs. I've heard they're collectible, other people say they're an investment. Theo, what do you think about that? Um, I think that uh, they could be both. It just depends on the person because um, NFTs uh, have a different value proposition than something like Bitcoin because they're basically uh, almost purely subjective value as far as like objective value. And um, by the nature of a token generation, it's, it's going to be generated by one um, entity, so by one human usually, as the whole supply when you mint it. Now it's permissionless in the sense that anyone can mint, you know, their own their own NFTs. So uh, yeah, it's definitely an innovation, and with every innovation, there can be scams. So I don't think it's I don't think it can be a scam or innovation. Usually, most um, innovations have scams, and there's a reason for that. That's because um, actually it would be really weird, uh, or it would be a or maybe even a red flag if there are no scammers. Because uh, scammers are experts at finding value um, and, and taking the value rather than creating value. So what, that's what scammers do really well. They're highly efficient at finding where there's value and new innovation and like taking that opportunity of scamming people rather than creating it. So uh, just because there are scammers doesn't mean that innovation is a scam. It means that scammers have figured out that there's value there that can be taken advantage of. Now, certainly when Bitcoin came out, there weren't any copies or similar coins or scams related around Bitcoin, right? No, never. Not at all. Like, uh, Bitcoin and mining? Bitcoin mining is not a scam, right? There was like, so there's been like different, like I'm trying to think of like different waves of scams. Like there was like, uh, kind of like, you know, yeah, I think like Bitcoin mining, but they weren't mining. It was just basically a Ponzi. So they just like take your Bitcoin and they like give you a little bit back over time. They say, oh yeah, the hash rate went away. But they weren't. Really See, that's inventive and creative. And when you have something valuable like Bitcoin, people are going to try to get in there. Now, I remember when at first they had gold and just gold bars, but people would cut off pieces of it and make it into jewelry. And all the gold people got upset because they were gold maximalists. And they said, you should never alter the form of gold. It needs to be a bar or a coin. If you make it into jewelry, it becomes unique. Sometimes they like the jewelry, sometimes they melt it down. <laughs> Vlad, do you think that NFTs are like this gold jewelry, a piece of Bitcoin, but melted down? They're scams. <laughs> They're all scams. Even Tom Brady and uh, Bill Murray, who just announced a deal with Coinbase today, and Tony Hawk, who's building his own metaverse skate park, all built on NFTs. OK, so there should be some nuance here. We should define what an NFT is, and it's always different according to the platform. Because you can take the same JPEG and publish it on two different platforms, 
and mint different tokens with that. And that's plagiarism, but it's not enforced by law, not all the time. And that's one way to scam. Another way to scam, actually, I think Bitcoin has the best kind of NFTs because you can name them. And that name is unique. A lot of people name their Bitcoins. Freddy, Joey, Ted. <laughs> so with Counterpart, you can actually name the tokens as opposed to Ethereum where you have a hash. And that's pretty I much it. I remember when I sold Freddy, he was so mad. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let's, let's layer the scam part, okay? I'm, I'm gonna play the scam guy. Everything is a scam. Okay, Everyone's so a scammer. NFTs are not a scam, and they're also not a JPEG. What's so interesting is people think they're collecting JPEGs, but really, they're collecting digital signatures. Uh, when I made our NFTs in 2017, we called them blockchain collectibles, because it was like a little collectible piece of the blockchain. And that's just the collectible side from there. You can go to tickets, like a temporary event, like a concert. You can go to clubs, like a permanent membership, and you can even go to marketing, like a business card that's trackable. Like if I gave out an NFT here, I could mark all those tokens as given out at Majorca, and then I could generate marketing information on them. So it's an incredible thing you can do with a signature that goes in your wallet that proves you collected something. From there, people add on rights, like if you have a board ape, allegedly, you can make your own TV show about it, but we're gonna find out in court, unfortunately, if they're all derivative. If you own the original ape, and I own cigar smoking ape, and you own ape with a hat, the guy who owns derivative ape, the original, he might own all the derivatives, all the copies and the variations of that ape. So we have to watch out. But right now they're collectibles, they're signatures, but they're scams. Vlad, should people invest their life savings in NFTs? Uh, I mean, if I was the guy selling the NFTs, I would say, oh yeah. Make me rich. But at, at the same time, yeah. I also want to ask you something like, what is an NFT? Because most commonly it gets defined as a token on a blockchain, which gets associated with a JPEG or something else, a music file or whatever. But there are also efforts to move it to a second layer, like Lightning with Taro or RGB. Is that also an NFT? Because it's no longer a cryptographic hash on a blockchain. It's stored on a second layer, which is client side. So each client stores their own information, and there's some validation between the peers. Is that still an NFT, or what do you call that? Well, at its core, I think the NFT is a proof of ownership. If you have the signature and you want in your wallet, you own it. If you have three out of four, then you want to collect that fourth signature. If you have four out of four, you're a great collector. You've collected the whole set. So it's about the ownership. And if you think about going back to antiques or baseball cards or comic books, who owned this comic book before me? It's very difficult. Who owned this Picasso painting? Sometimes it goes from the king to the prince to the queen to the king, and we can trace its provenance throughout the years. With an NFT, it's on a blockchain. We just go back through the addresses, and while the wallets don't say queen of England, prince of France, so forth, we can track every NFT back to its original source, whoever owned it. It's amazing provenance. It's always in mint condition, and it's a collectible that you own. Um, okay, there's a lot of things to unpack here, but uh, you asked if uh, like a token on Taro or Taro or Taro, what do you say? Taro, Taro uh, is still an NFT because it's client side. And I don't think I think so. Basically, what's happened is over the years. Um, that uh, the term NFT has become a big umbrella term for basically any token that's not uh, financial, I would say, basically. So any kind of collectible, could be an in-game asset, it could be um, a picture of a frog or a cat or, or berries. Um, it could be maybe a ticket uh, to an event that's like a one-time use, but then after that you still kind of collect it. Uh, anything like that, that's called, now called an NFT. It wasn't always like that. Um, it was, it was, uh, there was no word for it. We just called them rare pepes or spells of Genesis or curio cards or whatever. But then, um, the crypto punks on Ethereum, the guys that made that, they came up with this token standard ERC721, and that's a standard for one of one tokens. But, um, there were one of one tokens before that on Counterparty because you could still have the ability to do one of one tokens. So, um, so, Basically, uh, my answer to your question is, 
yes, they would still fit under that umbrella of entities if they're like a collectible of some kind, but I mean, the technicality <coughs> of it is definitely different. And I think uh, what we should do before, we, if we decide things are scams or uh, put all your money into it, actually, that's what, actually, uh, you asked if you should put all your money into it. I want to uh, give a very interesting, um, to compare uh, NF some things that we call NFTs to maybe scams or ICOs, like what is better. So in uh, 2018, I made uh, an, what's called an NFT called um, Pepe Nation, um, and it was making fun of a project called BitNation. And, uh, and um, so, and, and I think I made the whole, I think I made it, so there's a total supply of 9,999 of them. Um, because that just sounded like a really cool number, and I wanted like a really big supply. And uh, or no, I made actually no, no I made ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine of them because it should be like kind of like shit coins, like big supply, right? And uh, and it's divisible too, so everyone can have a little part of it. And uh, I'm and I looked at uh, I tried to figure out like Suzanne who does BitNation, like what what their token is, and I looked and like I could vaguely find there is a token. And it has like a really small market cap and like horrible liquidity. But my token making fun of BitNation is worth way more now and has way more liquidity than BitNation, a whole like early ICO project uh, that existed. So I'm not saying that they're, you know, either one is a scam or not. There's like different criteria if they're going to do what they say. But I think that's really interesting. And the final word on the scam is the reason that. Um, the Joshua head is not a scam, it's because it's a Joshua head. It says it's a Joshua head, and that's it. It doesn't claim that it's solving, um, like, dental coin, like solving, like, the dental industry with a, with a token. It's, it's doing what it says. Now, if you want it, now, if you think you're going to make a million bucks on Joshua Head, well, that's your decision. You could think you make yeah. a million. Yeah. yeah. He came in right at that. If you, if you think, uh, so now he's pumping the Joshua Head market cap has now reached an all-time high since he entered the room. Uh, and, uh, you know, liquidity has quadrupled uh, since he entered. But, uh, yeah, no, it doubled because there's two heads. Uh, one, two. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. The supplies of 1,000 tokens. This one's ultimately. He has, like, 200. Well, I think Theo's right on here. With an ICO or some of these other projects, there's always a promise. We will make this. We will deliver that. And sometimes it works out. They build the software. Sometimes they run off with the money. Other times, they're not capable of building the software. They're not capable of fulfilling the promise. Whereas with an NFT or a collectible, usually the thing you're being presented with is the whole thing. When you get the Pepe Nation card, you own it. You can then do what you want with that signature. Uh, all these other things attached onto them, like crypto punks have this idea that you own the image and then you can enforce the image, which is the copyright system, which we all know depends on what country you're in, how much money you have for lawyers, and how much time you're willing to wait and who you're willing to sue. Whereas ownership, owning the token, having the signature, that's absolute. You own it or you don't own it. If Theo sends me a Pepe Nation ticket, I have the Pepe now, that's it. He can't get it back. He'd have to use an external system like the legal system to force me to give it back or the copyright to make my Pepe worthless if he owns more of them or whatever. So it's not quite a scam, but that's not to say that there aren't many NFTs being sold now that will be worth less than before. But if you bought it for the right purpose, like a collector, like if my favorite band put out NFTs, I'm gonna be psyched because that's my band. If I spent $100,000 and it's worth 10 now, I'm going to be sad because it's worth less, but that feeling of ownership from the band is still there. So it depends what you bought it for. Um, I think that uh, we should also back up and like talk about uh, like why Vlad, Theo, and Thomas are on the panel and like what they have to do with NFTs. Like, Vlad, Vlad, how did you get involved? Well, actually, uh, we said something counterparty a bunch of times. Counterparty is this archaic uh, protocol that's on top of Bitcoin. It's archaic because it's from 2014 originally. And uh, so it's pre-Ethereum. And uh, it's, uh, 
it, it uses um, something called OP returns uh, in, in Bitcoin. So it's kind of like, so some people, there's, there's a whole debate about it that happened in 2014 and ongoing. That it's like some people are like, that's not what it was meant to be used for. But basically, it, it allows for tokens to be created on Bitcoin. All you need is a counterparty wallet that reads this OP return in the way so that you can see the tokens. And um, Thomas, uh, you want to say what you did? So like Theo was saying, at first there was just counterparty tokens like Spells of Genesis. It was very early. It was kind of like a Magic the Gathering game. You would collect the cards, and then you could play the game with the cards. And the cards, again, are actually signatures in your wallet, which is great about arguing disputes. Do you really own a fireball? Show me your wallet. I want to see the signature of the fireball. Then came Rare Pepes, which Theo was involved in, which were more like baseball cards. They had like pictures on them, and then had have like different amounts, like a thousand of this one or five hundred of that one. Uh, when I came along and looked at the space, I tried to make a startup in 2017 called Curio Cards. And what we did is we took the similar idea of a collectible and put it on the Ethereum blockchain, so that it was kind of had new tools and a new programming language, and was a lot better in a lot of ways. But mainly, we took the ERC20 token and kind of hacked some stuff around it to make it behave like a collectible. So if you sent your money to the vending machine, it would send you back a token. And no one wanted them at all, and the startup completely failed, and they all blamed me. But then, four years later, the internet sleuth started digging around and looking for old NFT projects, and they found curio cards, they found rare pepes, they found spells of Genesis, they even found a thing called Pixel Map that was like the million dollar homepage. They sold little squares, and of course that went crazy. They found an even earlier project called Etheria, where he created map tokens for a game. And that was it, they were map tokens, and people went nuts buying, you know, A4, B7. You know, C5, A13 is mine forever. And they went nuts buying these things. So there's obviously been a lot of change since four years ago in the historical NFT period. And then Vlad, why are you here? Uh, I did Bitcoin heads. So basically Pokemon cards, but with faces of Bitcoiners. And I have like, Seven or eight of them so far. He has Mike in space. He has Joshua. And, and what's the chip on the back? What's going on there? Oh, so I worked with a French or Belgian guy. I'm not sure where he's from, but it's called Sato Chip. And <laughs> what it does is that it puts the tokens on a smart card. It's kind of like a hardware wallet, except that it's printed. It has a token in it, so you'll also have the NFT and it's physical. And I think it's a really cool way to show it off. They're also sealed, so they were never taken out. If you want to verify, you're going to need a USB device, which connects to your laptop or whatever. And I just wanted to say that I thought NFTs were a huge scam first. And then I realized, OK, I can do this on Bitcoin, and I can send an LP return transaction. And right now, this is going to exist on the blockchain on everyone's full node forever. Which is kind of insane, yeah. because I'm pretty sure that Bitcoin as a network is going to outlive me. And, uh, uh, you know, the idea that something as stupid as this, no offense, like it's getting sold for $100 right now, and it's going to be there, and my children are going to sing their full notes, and they're going to download blocks for, I basically spam them with messages which contain information about this too, and that's insane. That's why I like doing this on Bitcoin. Some people are going to hate me because they're going to sync their nodes slower because of counterparty transactions, but I pay the fee to the miners. It's a fee market. I, I'm not sure if it's anyone's business. Greg Maxwell would punch me in the face right now for saying something like this because he hates counterparty. But it's interesting. It's a non-financial way to use Bitcoin, and I just want to add that I have a friend whose name is Justin Wales, and he's a lawyer in the United States. He's from Miami. And I spoke with him, and he presents Bitcoin in an academic paper, which he published at the University of Miami. As, so he presents Bitcoin as a free speech network. And he presents from Satoshi's first message, which some people say it was an NFT, Chancellor on the brink of second bailout for banks. That's a message that he put in the Genesis block. And he did much more than a financial transaction. He sent a message there. 
And my friend Justin, he's a lawyer, and he wants it to be protected under the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. Because you can put like a message there, a political message in the Bitcoin blockchain, and that's free speech. That's a way for you to express your own thoughts, and nobody else can take that away from you. It's going to exist forever. So if we are able to make Bitcoin more complicated, then the regulators are going to have a harder time, which means we're not going to get regulations that fit a certain club. As I feel like people like Michael Saylor come around and they're like, this is a commodity, this is digital gold, this is electric money, this is whatever. They're making it too easy for regulators to figure out. If you treat Bitcoin as software, and software can do a lot of stuff, including non-financial stuff, then you're going to basically prove to everyone that it's not what they think it is. Bitcoin is software, and it's whatever we use it as. If we all decide that we can use it as gold, we can use it as gold. But if we want to use it for non-financial activities, then that's something that nobody can take away from us, and it's part of a free network. So I can argue that NFTs are a scam, but at the same time, I respect everyone's freedom to use their own money however they want. I mean, that's the same thing. You can't stop people from using Bitcoin for shit that you don't agree with. You know, they could use it for anything. They could, like, send it to the Communist Party or, donate like, Nazis or donate it to whatever, or all kinds of shit. Or they could send it about. all to a null address. If we sent all 21 mil million Bitcoins to 0000, zero, zero, zero it's over. A whole revolution. In, in a way, in a way, um, Bitcoin, the way, that, the way that people store Bitcoin on wallets is similar <coughs> to how people look at their NFTs. Because what you're doing is you're collecting B logos. So how many B logos do you have? And you open your wallet, and it's like ta da, and like you see the big B symbol, and you're like, wow, I have so many Bs, and I have an Ethereum logo, and I'm like, wow, I have so many Ethereum logos, and yeah, there's not like a clear consensus on the exact logo, but that's because there's not just one artist, because it's part because it's the network token. So there's not one entity that created you know each Bitcoin, whereas like an NFT one entity mints it, so there's not just one image. But there is an image associated, like Doge, that's why Doge cards has an image of a dog, right? So it's like collecting. Do you well, actually I, own the JPEG when you own the Doge? You own the token. So my, so uh, yeah, that the whole thing, the whole, that, that whole debate about like, what do you own? You own the token, um, and the token is what you collect, and everybody can see the JPEG. It's the same thing when, um, you can think of it when there's an album, uh, CD, uh, or some of you might remember uh, records, cassette tapes, records, yeah. radio. So there's a radio, and then you put a cassette tape and you record the radio, but you don't own the album. So it's the same thing. You can right click save an image, but you don't have the token. So if you want to have the real thing, you have to have the token. And if you could write, you, if I invite any right play, right click savers to just simply right click save a real expensive NFT and just resell it. And then, they, then the proposition that if you can right-click save something should be that you should be able to sell it onto the market because the market has decided that... You have the same JPEG. It you should have the same, same JPEG, value, right, right? But it doesn't because the market is valuing the token, not the, not the JPEG itself. And so, uh, I want to go back to something Vlad said earlier about the NFTs lasting forever. Uh, Vlad's NFTs are on Bitcoin and Counterparty as well as Theo's Rare Pepe's. So they're very lucky they're attached to the Bitcoin network. When we were making our Curio Card NFTs, we almost copied Ethereum and made our own version of Ethereum, Curio F, because we would control everything. We would print them, we would own them all, we would have the protocol rules. We'd also have to update it ourselves and mine it ourselves. If we'd done that, it's very possible our NFTs would have disappeared. And when people went to find out about them, they would have just read about them and not been able to use them. Because the Ethereum blockchain is still here, you can still use those NFTs, you can do things with them. So it really is amazing to publish your work, even if it's just a signature to one of these distributed projects, because then like Vlad said, every node has a Curio card on it. Every Bitcoin node has counterparty on it. So it's really amazing to see them last forever like that. And even if maybe they're like tulips, where at one point you could buy a house with the right variation of tulip, and now you could just you know buy five, $10, they're still worth something, they're still very pretty, and you can collect them. Are we done? No, I just want to take this back to Hal Finney. <laughs> Hal Finney, yeah, tell us about Hal Finney. 
Is any, has anyone heard of Halfeni before? Yeah. Okay, cool. So on the Cypherpunk mailing list in 94, he published a message which basically alluded to constructing some sort of cryptographic trading cards and basically owning caches and trading them between nerds. And that served no purpose, and that's what NFTs are actually, except that we figured they are how to attach images to them. True. But if Hal Finney was alive, but technically he is alive because he's cryogenated, is that how you say it? I, I think so, oh, yes. It's true. So he is kind of alive, but kind of dead at the same time. We'll find out in the future. But if he comes back, I guess he's going to look at Rare Pepe's and be like, oh yeah, this is exactly what I wish I had. Let me burn the Bitcoins I mined back in 2010 to buy some DJ Pepe or yeah, whatever. That's true. Yeah, I think that uh, that's definitely true. Another another thing, if, I mean, if we're like ending basically, is uh, what, um, I mean, I kind of look at it as, um, and maybe... Maybe you think that too, Thomas, like kind of like when you do something and you don't know what's going to happen, you kind of look back and you're like, did I create like a Frankenstein? Like, what did I do? Like, what the hell is going on? You know what I mean? So some days I wake up and I look on the internet and I'm thinking, oh shit, this is like, what did we do? It's like created like this Frankenstein. It's like, like Paris Hilton. Paris Hilton, yeah, Tom like, Brady, Tony Hawk. Yeah, exactly. So you're like, what the hell is this? And like, I was at the... NFT NYC conferences like the past three ones and like everyone is huger and I'm like what the hell is this? It's like not like this is crazy. This is like insane. And um but the good thing or the crazy thing is actually is um it's growing um the whole it's growing Bitcoin and Ethereum because it's bringing a totally different mindset of people. That's what I keep saying, like in all the presentations. So all the people that are interested in sound money, they're already here. All the people that are like hardcore libertarians, they already know about Bitcoin. All the people that are traders, professional or otherwise, or in a dark market people, they already know about crypto. So who's left? Well, artists, musicians, people that like Pokemon cards, people that. Normal people, normies, people that play video games all day. It doesn't matter if you like those people or think those people are idiots or whatever, but now they're exposed to NFTs and they're going to get it, and they are by default exposed to all of the other concepts that I just listed sound money, libertarianism, Bitcoin, sensor resistance stuff, all that stuff. They're learning that too. So you have what's so beautiful like about the whole room is this whole like crazy clash of ideas and ideologies and it just like has this weird nuclear reaction and you get like Frankenstein and other cool stuff too. So and like zombies and crazy shit. So like that's kinda like what's going on. And there are a lot of scams that come out of that, but that's just the nature of innovation and I think everyone in this room is like really diligent. I mean I speak out about all kinds of you are like your entity or scams deal, what the hell you're doing like that. I talk about entity scams all the time. You know, tell people, you know, like the 10K PFP thing is probably a scam. You're probably going to lose money if you buy it and like all this other stuff. So it's just the nature of, of new things have a lot of scams. It doesn't make the thing a scam itself. And I think that most of pe we should embrace the like creativity, crazy aspect of bringing new people in. That's going to attract a whole new type of person. Because just like banging the same drum of like sound money and inflation, all this shit, people don't get that until they're like really hurt. But they might understand frogs, um, grapes, and cat pictures. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Theo on this. I think NFTs are the greatest promotional opportunity for Bitcoin that we never asked for. And just because you didn't ask for it doesn't mean you don't need it or it might not be good for you. A thousand frogs, a thousand crypto punks, a million of these things. Yeah, it doesn't really have anything to do with like cypherpunk and sound money and these things, but like Theo was saying, eventually they'll come back to Bitcoin. Eventually they'll study Ethereum. They'll be curious about the thing that allows them to own the frogs, that allows them to own the punks. Also, all Bitcoiners like collectibles. Like all, all people like collectibles. It's an innate thing, and especially when you see someone and they have a full set and you only have three out of four, it's just natural. You're like, that guy's a better collector than me. He must have got here earlier. He must have paid more. And then you're, you're a little way, you're like, 
I'll bet I'm going to get that fourth one. I'll bet I'm going to get the complete set. <laughs> or this is just a sign of hyperinflation, and we're just denying it. And we're buying frogs instead of bonds because they provide a higher yield or whatever. That, that's market efficiency, isn't it? All right, I think that's uh, we're done with the panel. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Everyone, we're going to go to the big, big lunch buffet now. Thank you very much, guys. And now there will be lunchtime. Let's see if there will be a great surprise. A surprise. <laughs>
lot of different ways where you hold your Bitcoin. Uh, short about me, I am into a, uh, in IT security, so I uh, have knowledge about how to keep secrets like secret keys and stuff. And uh, for over 20 years, I'm in IT security. Um, today, I'm mostly doing like I think now it's called DevOps. I, I thought about well, this like you are a Swiss admin, but it's maybe old school. And um, mostly, I'm doing BISC and Mempool Space nowadays. That's all. Make main stuff that I'm doing. It's totally not related to the talk. Um, so, uh, shortly, the difference between uh, a seed and a secret key. You can in interchangeably uh, use this for my talk, but <coughs> basically, the seed is um, if you have a seed, then um, from, from the seed, all your private keys that you ever will use for addresses uh, are derived from that. So, um, I think the better term is. How, where, where is your seat located? Because that's like the main thing about everything else. Okay, I can't can't do the talk without saying uh, if if your seat generation is not secure, so there's like a backdoor in some random number generator or something, then um, it's basically work. Everything else is like worthless because uh, then somebody else maybe already know what your private key is, or has an idea with uh, uh, limited search space that they have to find um, the secret key. And that's also possible if, uh, if your hardware device, for example, or your notebook or whatever is never online. There could be this backdoor I'm talking about that, that an attacker already knows something about how the key will be created. Um, a little bit um, about general security measures that are in place or that you look, should look for. The first thing is uh, the secure, uh, the, the attack surface should be really small. So um, don't have like a big system that does hundreds of other things. Um, then you should have like a um, secure uptake path. So it could be that there is uh, in your system there is some problem uh, that needs fixes, and then there must be also a secure path to, to update your hardware wallet, for example. So if there is not a secure path, then maybe there is a problem that an attacker can, um, can get to your seed. And another thing is always, uh, if it's simple to use, it's more safe, because there are less things that you can do wrong, basically. Um, then another part that we already heard is uh, like reproducibility, that you can uh, verify that the software and hardware is actually what you bought and not, not something else. Um, partly is you have some sort of security built into the hardware. Uh, secure key generation, you already had that topic. And future proof, I think, is also important because uh, if you're buying something and it's not updated and not looked after, um, then uh, you have to get rid of it and then put the seed somewhere else. And you, um, there's also a problem that maybe there's, uh, uh, you do something wrong. So general security problems. Are, um, the biggest one, I think, <laughs> is a supply chain attack. So if you're buying something, um, for example, a hardware wallet, then uh, it's totally clear what you want to do with it. Because it's clear, okay, it's a Bitcoin hardware wallet, so um, I'm not doing something else with it. I'm not playing Tetris on it or something. So I, I want to do something. So the supply chain uh, attack could be could be that uh, some part of the hardware is changed, or if you uh, get get it sent, or you buy it from some uh, other vendor, then um, you uh, get maybe a changed device that's not actually the hardware wallet you want to buy. There's maybe some malware or some, something uh, built in. Um, yeah, then on a normal computer you have malware, like you install something and it installs something else uh, and backdoors basically your computer. Um, then in the software itself, it can be that you're downloading, um, that even, even the software itself is okay, but you downloading a library or something, and that has a backdoor in it. 
Um, then more on the hardware side, you have side channel attacks, so that, um, um, uh, yeah, don't want to go too deep into that, um, and maybe a sentence later. Um, power glitching is also something like side channel attacks, it's, uh, it's different, it tries to, um, um, for example, if you have a hardware wallet that uh, doesn't allow to read out the, the memory, the flash memory that's built in, um, you can trick it if you uh, stop the power at the exact right point, then it skips some instruction and the uh, flash memory is readable anyways. And uh, there's this chip whisperer, it's like a um, chip device, it's like $200, $300, and that's already good enough to do something uh, on, on, on chips. Uh, and then there's always radio emissions, so it could be that somebody is nearby you and uh, can maybe get from, from the radio emissions information about uh, your secret key for it, your seed. Um, yeah, that then types of where, where, where the seed um, is located. And, and um, RAM is mostly in RAM, uh, is, it, is it mostly uh, when you unlock it? then it needs to be somewhere where, where the crypto function can access it, and it's mostly RAM. Depends on uh, their use examples where it's differently. Um, yeah, and then normally it's, if you have a normal software where it's on a, on a disk, hopefully it's encrypted on a disk. Um, then there are such things, um, for example, Intel's CPU has this SGX, actually they, the newer ones don't have that anymore. Um, uh, So-called secure enclave, and it's like a separate processor, or a sep yeah, separate processor that does, does the security function. It's like locked down. And for hardware wallets and uh, small <coughs> devices, there is something that is not directly built into the processor. Uh, that's called secure element. It's like a separate processor that does the security functions or other stuff, uh, there are examples. Um, and then the, for, for like businesses, there are like, like stuff that you put in your, in your data center shelf, it's called a uh, hardware security model, but um, that's not the scope of the, of the talk. And then, then there's, for sure, you can write your seed on a paper <coughs> or on metal, but um, then it's there, but you can't use it. I mean, you can't spend your Bitcoin if, uh, if it's on paper or metal. I mean, can't calculate everything yourself on paper. Okay, first, there are the hot top uh, wallets. And there's like the, the most, <laughs> the worst example is, uh, is, is a web wallet. I mean, you shouldn't use it. Um, and I have like positive and, uh, positive and negative uh, things about it. So firstly, um, um, you see it somehow is in RAM because um, at least it's not a custodial solution. So you, your browser, has in RAM the, the seed at some point. Maybe it's on disk because it's uh, saved in a, in, um, in a cookie or saved in, in local storage in your browser. And uh, it's also blockchain.com, uh, uh, the example, it's also encrypted on their server. So you can receive it even if you have using, a, uh, using another browser. Um, so the only positive thing is it's super easy to use. <laughs> I mean, just open the browser and it works. Um, but that's basically all that already <laughs> all that is there because uh, the, the negatives are pretty much ev everything that you can imagine. Uh, first, there is um, man in the middle attacks. It could be that you are on the wrong, wrong website and put in your, your pin or whatever you need for that and the attacker can then use the right, right website and get to it, for example. Um, then it's not verifiable. I mean, the, the problem is on a website, you're not, every time you visit it, you're not every time checking what the, what the site does. It could be changed just a minute before, or it could be only changed for you and not for somebody else. So there's no, you can't verify what the uh, JavaScript code in the website is doing. So uh, there's, um, you, you, you totally trust that every time you get uh, something that's not, not, uh, not stealing your seed. Um, yeah, and it's a super big attack surface because you're using it on a computer, for example, and um, in a browser, and you have 
like even your operating system can have uh, have a backdoor, have, can have malware, and then uh, yeah, you're toast. So the next one is uh, a wallet on a computer. Best example, I mean, Bitcoin Core, Electrum, Spectre, Wasabi, whatever. <coughs> there are like a bunch of them, and uh, at a certain time, your key is for sure in RAM. Because uh, if you unlock the wallet, or if you want to sign a transaction and send your Bitcoin, then at that time, the seed needs to be in RAM. So, and if you have some malware, then like that's the, the point in time where you can grab that, or can change the function of the software. Um, for sure, it's encrypted on, on the hard disk, so if you're not using your wallet, then it's at least encrypted. And maybe you have some backups. So it could be also that you have, have it on another hard disk where you have your backup or cloud storage. So um, then also encrypted. So positive is um, normally you have the wallet has a secure update function. It downloads um, an update, or you can verify that the, that uh, it's um, it's exactly the open source. For example, the, the source code is actually uh, what you're executing. Most of them have that. Um, yeah, simple to use, easy to verify the integrity, like PGP site, you can see that, check that. Um, negative, yeah, big, big support, uh, attack service, because you have a normal computer that does like 100 things in the background that you don't know of, and maybe some part of it uh, uh, is trying to steal your seed. Um, yeah, and then, Somehow a big problem is that you you can verify that you have the right software, but maybe you're downloading it. There was an example just a week ago. You're downloading it, uh, the, the wallet from the Microsoft Store, and that's not actually the right wallet. It's a malware version of the wallet that a Trojan one that uh, steals your seed. So um, I mean <laughs> that's uh, that's a problem. So then there are hot wallets. That you have on the phone, and they are slightly different than on a computer. Um, for sure, you have the secure update function that mostly built on <coughs> your phones. Um, that if you once have the right wallet, you get the same from the same vendor the wallet again in the update. Uh, it's simple to use, yeah, sure. Um, negative one is um, uh, I would say like a middle attack surface because you have like separation of applications. So if you have like some malware application downloaded, then at least it's not directly has access to your wallet software. So a mm, little bit better than that. Still yeah. negative because it's a, it's a mobile phone that does hundreds of things. Um, yeah, you easily can get the Trojan version of your of your wallet because mostly you look at the picture and name in the uh, in the app store and then. Maybe it's not actually the right one. Um, yeah, hard to verify the integrity is uh, because you can't use PGP and see if it's really signed by the. You basically, by the developer, uh, you're basically trusting the app store. They they do that, and um, they are not 100% uh, trustworthy. They 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 only check that some individual puts that in, but it could be also some money you want to steal. You see. So now we go into cold storage wallets. Um, they are the <laughs> do-it-yourself uh, wallets. I mean, that was the thing that you do, did in the, in the beginning uh, because there was nothing else. Um, like you have an offline notebook, you install all what you need, and then you never go online again. Uh, or the same with an old phone, for example, old mobile phone, and you install <coughs> your hardware wallet on it. Um, okay, it's on the RAM and on the disk of the device. Uh, sure. Um, positive thing is no supply chain attack. I mean, you have an old phone lying around. I mean, that's like super far fetched that there is a backdoor for your Bitcoin application in it. I mean, in the future maybe, but uh, if you get like something that is even older than Bitcoin, then <laughs> how? Or should that be a problem? So no, basically no supply chain attack. Um, negative one is it, it's really hard to do it right. Uh, I mean, there's so many obstacles and, and things that you really need to do right, and then maybe you have some problem and you think, oh, just put the Wi-Fi on again a little bit and check something, and then basically you're already doing it wrong. Um, 
And it's, yeah. And then it's also very hard to update. Uh, you basically have to begin from scratch, I suppose. I, I don't know. Um, I, I'm not like a fan of, uh, of, of that type uh, 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 to store your seed. Um, yeah, and it's a big uh, uh, a text server. It's still like a, com com a, a mobile phone or a computer that runs a whole operating system that does like thousands of things. And maybe the newest version of the operating system has already some backdoor built in. Uh, n nobody saw that before and uh, later. Uh, you see this guy. But because you even even if it's going never online, um, if you're doing transaction, you can um, um, put information in the blockchain about the secret key. So there is a way that even even you're using the transaction that you sign with your offline wallet uh, and tra transporting the information about your secret key. Um, now a few manufacturer or projects. Uh, just a few examples of common things that you see. Uh, one is the seed sign. It's a really nice device. It's, uh, uh, it's basically Raspberry Pi Zero. Hopefully the version without Wi-Fi because it should be offline. Um, and a camera module and this display. And uh, basically <laughs> you see this in the RAM of the device if you're using it. But before you want to use it, uh, want to use it, you you need to scan a QR code that you make yourself on a paper. Um, I see a little bit of problem there because then you always have uh, your your seed words on this QR code laying. I mean, it needs to be somewhere near your wallet, uh, your, your seed signer, and it's like clear text on a paper. I don't know um, if that's like. Good thing, but okay. Um, positive, uh, basically no supply chain. Everyone uses Raspberry Pi Zeros for all sorts of projects. Um, it has a nice manual key uh, generation option. Just want to mention that. I mean, it's a nice. <coughs> the software is really nicely made and like uh, has interesting things built in. Uh, negative, it's still. Uh, a big attack surface because the Raspberry Pi basically runs a whole Linux operating system. It's basically Debian with, uh, I, I checked, it's about one or two gigabytes of stuff that you run there. Okay, not all is binary, but uh, it's, it's basically not, not, it's just too much software that you can't verify. Um, and every install is different because it only uses the rest last packages that you install on the Raspberry Pi, so you, you can't be sure that your version you're running right now is like, it's always like every device is another running some other software versions, and so there can always be something in, and you can't, 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 yeah. Um, the next one is uh, Spectre DIY, it's close to the, to the seed signer, it's a um, total other device. It's a, a dev kit for with a phone display, and it has like various things. Um, uh, basically, this, uh, the, it's basically nearly the same function as uh, the seed sign. It doesn't have the QR code. You write down your your seed words, it works or 24 words uh, instead, so it's not, not so shiny, <laughs> I suppose. Um, positive is um, there's maybe no supply chain attack. Uh, maybe that's a little bit overstated because I mean it's it's a dev kit that's not so many people using. So maybe um, people know if you buy that, then maybe you want to build a hardware wallet. Um, smaller attack surface because it's not running an operating system. It's basically a microcontroller that runs a small piece of code. And uh, if you have a small piece of code, there's the chance that you can read the whole thing and figure out what it does, uh, and there's nothing running in, in the behind. Uh, yeah, something else, part of uh, the software itself, the hardware wallet software itself. Uh, negative a little bit is uh, it's, it's a dashboard, and it has like a bunch of 
uh, additional stuff like microphone and uh, it has Bluetooth built in and other stuff. And so if it's built in, there's always the chance that they are, uh, it's not like via hardware disabled. It's still there. So um, normally hardware wallet only should have exactly what you need for the purpose and nothing added because everything that you add um, yeah, broadens the um, attack surface. Um, this is a really interesting one from Blockstream, the Jade wallet. Interesting because uh, the concept where uh, storing a key, <laughs> or your seed, your seed, um, block check, uh, block stream trade. Um, if you're using it, always it's in RAM of the microcontroller. Um, but the seed is encrypted on the blockchain cloud service. So if the cloud service is down, you can't access it. Um, but it's interesting. Uh, it's uh, not on the device because mostly you want for from hardware wallets you want to unlock it with a pin like a four digit pin and um, you need to limit it twice for that because if you're not limiting it it's only 10,000 uh, combination that you can do so uh, that's simple crackable um, you just put something on it and just crack it maybe you can even do it by hand I mean it's only 10,000 <laughs> a few days um, so you need to limit how often you can do that. And they use their cloud service and checking how often you're trying the pin and then just saying, okay, you already tried five times. Uh, next day you can do the next five. And so limited that you not um, yeah, try unlimited things. Um, it has a secure update function as most, I mean, every wallet should have, every hardware wallet. Um, the software is open source, so you can even build it yourself, so then avoid like this supply chain attack. Um, yeah. Negative is normally if you're buying a device from them, you have the supply chain attack because it's clearly a wallet. Uh, uh, then there's a Trezor 1 and Trezor Model T. I'm not differentiating between both because they are uh, based, you know, they, they are basically the same from what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, if you're using it, it's in the RAM of the microchip, um, you see. And if you're not using it and it's offline, it's in the flash and it has this called readout protection, the chip. It's a STM uh, microchip. And um, I wanted to say something about that. Um, the, the positive thing is, um, is that secure update function, yeah. All software is open source, we had, had to talk before. <laughs> so, I mean, if there's something not open source, uh, it's like, for me, it's a no-go on, on, on your seed storage. A uh, negative one is um, that the seed is in the microcontroller flash, and um, it, it's readout protected, but there are ways to get to the seed. So you always should use additional passphrase, but passphrase has have other problems from usability perspective. So yeah, and still supply chain attack. I mean, you're ordering a hardware wallet. Um, yeah. Then Ledger Nano S. I think so many people use that one, so it needs to be in here. Um, it has a secure element. And the secure element does all the encryption stuff. So, and the secure element is closed source. You're not really knowing what it's actually doing or if it's doing additional stuff. Um, still, it has a secure update function. <coughs> sure, it's out. Makes no, and you always have that, hopefully. Um, the seed is always in the secure element, so you can maybe say, okay, it's it's a special chip that is made to keep this secret. So it's positive. Negative is, um, yeah, the, the seed handling is closed source. I already saw that you you don't know exactly what it's doing. And additionally, um, the secure element is driven by a normal microprocessor, and the microprocessor shows the display and uh, uh, checks the buttons. So the security uh, secure element is basically blind and trusts what the 
processor, normal microprocessor does. And um, that's, uh, I mean, there are many ways around tricking the CQ element to do, do something, and display shows something else. So, not not the best model, in my opinion. Uh, and sure, supply chain attack. Oh, I think this is the last one. <laughs> uh, Bitbox zero two. It's uh, it's a newer uh, wallet, and I put it in the same uh, on the same slide as Cold Card V three. I haven't looked at. V4, there are some changes on the code card, but uh, nothing super major. Um, uh, yeah, sure. The seat is in the RAM if you're using it, because um, uh, the, your seat is encrypted in the flash, and the encryption key is actually, or a part of the encryption key comes from the CQ element This is built in. So the CQ element doesn't know your seat, but it knows the way to decrypt your seat, but it, not, not, uh, it hasn't access to the thing that is decrypting. So I think it is an interesting, like, middle way. You have, like, a secure element, um, but you're not trusting it with uh, signing and uh, doing all the operations that the uh, um, hardware wallet needs to do. Um, positive again for both, it's a secure update function built in. Can't do anything wrong. Um, all software is open source. You can discuss about licensing, <laughs> licenses, but basically you can look at um, at the software. Um, yeah, I already said this. The description is in a secure. Um, uh, the description key is in a secure element. Uh, negative, still supply chain attack. <coughs> So, and then, mostly there, before we go into questions, I will just answer the obvious question. But what should I use? <laughs> what is the real one? Uh, short answer is, uh, depends. I mean, that's why it's trade-offs. It's not, maybe it's not the perfect thing for everybody. Um, basically, short, don't use a web wallet. It's just, it just makes no sense. It's, it's like the worst option, don't, don't use it. There's no... Why, why, why you should use that? Um, if you have small amounts, then use a software wallet because it's, you don't need an extra device like a hardware wallet or something. And uh, if you lose it, it's like like your spare change. Um, and then for bigger amounts, use a hardware wallet. Just use a hardware wallet that comes from a vendor, and you have to decide which which hardware wallet option is the best. But uh, basically, the hardware wallets are made that you don't shoot yourself in the foot. Uh, and they work. But if you're saying, oh, maybe some hardware wallet, maybe there's a problem or something, then for like huge amounts, you use three hardware wallets and you use a two of three multisig. And so, like, if one wallet has a problem, then the whole setup, your whole keys uh, or your whole Bitcoin are still safe. Yeah. And there's there's just, I say, huge amounts, big amounts, small amounts. Because that's also something you yourself need to figure out what that's for you. I mean, that depends. Yeah. That's all. Thank you.
So, yeah, obviously the stickers, take as many as you want. <coughs> take any of that back with me. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about DarkFi, um, and I'm also going to talk about this new emerging field of anonymous engineering. I'm also going to give a bit about the macro of the crypto markets and, and so on. Um, Actually, I just realized something. Sorry, what's it? One more thing I have to do. So uh, DarkFi is um, uh, L1 for anonymous uh, smart contracts or developing anonymous uh, uh, crypto applications with. So um, typically inside of crypto, uh, <coughs> privacy projects have, have massively underperformed and um, you know, um, 2020-2021 there was this uh, kind of uh, bullish phase uh, you know where everybody was talking about you know mass adoption meme and the big money came in and all these pumpy projects took off and um, you know uh, privacy projects did not really experience that that pump and also um, a lot of privacy projects have typically had very bad economic incentive engineering for example the dev tax with with Zcash, uh, but I think we're in a in a unique phase of the crypto market now. So first of all, uh, cryptography research is undergoing a renaissance, uh, the likes of which we haven't ever seen before, largely driven because of cryptocurrency. But there are a whole host of new techniques now, such as uh, multi-party computation, uh, zero knowledge proofs, homomorphic encryption many different techniques which um and, and and also going beyond that you know vrfs and constant size accumulators and you know um jacobians of hyper elliptic curves and a lot of really advanced things that basically uh, unlock an entirely new design space of anonymous applications which wasn't before previously uh, possible to create the second thing is the, the essentially um, the main power that central bank has is to create uh, dollars or to create fiat currency. And yet in cryptocurrency, we have stable coins are essentially inflating the fiat supply with impunity. In Egypt, where I was, where I was a couple of months ago, they have 15% premium on the dollar, not on their local currency. 15%. That means if I, that means um, when we sell USDC stablecoin, we get 15% extra in terms of dollars. The USDC is worth more than the dollars. So this is a huge threat also for Europe because the, the euro is, is dog shit basically. It's, it's a crappy currency. That's why now they've made these new laws, the MICA laws, M-I-C-A, which essentially is 
specifically targeting stable coins. So, um, so that's uh, that regulation or that punitive regime from the states that's <coughs> incoming now to the crypto space. The, the slow machinery of the state of the state is is uh, warming up. So um, in so in ancient uh, in ancient Egypt, uh, they had uh, a moon god. The fuck, I'm not gonna pay for you anymore ever again. Wikipedia, I never did anyway. <laughs> they they got rid of crypto because they're like, oh, crypto is not SJW. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so um, the moon god Thoth is um, the god of the moon, the wisdom, writing, hieroglyphs, science, magic, uh, art and judgment. And in Egypt they had a, a male and a female god, they were often together. And the female counterpart of Thoth was Sesha, which is goddess of accounting, architecture, astronomy, astrology, building, mathematics and surveying. <clears throat> so the moon god ha it has a very uh, important symbolism. And in particular, what the moon god Thoth did was illuminate the path for those people that walk at night, the night walkers. So uh, there is another legacy, which is, um, so for example, which is the sun god, historically. And, you know, um, a solar deity is, is usually worshipped by, because of its perceived power and strength. So the sun as a symbol is a hot static object in the sky. And it's not a coincidence that uh, monotheism, uh, sun worship, uh, and the, the authority of the sun, which is monotheist religions, come from the desert, which is a flat, homogenous uh, space. Um, you know, the sun gods across multiple cultures uh, are, the, are the, the, the gods of the rulers. So Ra, the sun god, in, uh, I don't know how to say that, in, in Aztecs. In, uh, in Sumeria, Utu, which is like the police god, which enforced justice on the other gods. So uh, the sun is a symbol that's intimately connected with surveillance. Um, that's why, for example, you see Eve community now, a lot of them are, are talking about public goods funding and, um, and identity systems, because in their paradigm, everything has to be transparent in order to Systems like UBI can only exist in a tr in a completely transparent system where everybody is monitored, surveilled, and tracked. So, um, so there's this tendency of the of the state system, which is is connected with the sun gods, which um, the surveillance paradigm wants to turn everything into a desert. It wants to remove all forms of of diversity, and uh, and. Uh, Sorokin, and, and essentially, you know, we are between two epochs, the, the Western civilization, the civilization that in its ascendant phase was associated with the sun, like the period of the Enlightenment or the Rena Renaissance, which that's, that's what Enlightenment means, is the illuminating of the, of the sunlight, and also the symbolism of Saint George, who killed the dragon, um, essentially, uh, we, are we are between the two epochs, the dying sensei culture of, of yesterday and the coming uh, ideational or idealistic culture of, of tomorrow. And so the rays of sunlight, they still illuminate the glory of this passing epoch, but the light is slowly fading. And in the deepening shadows, it becomes more and more difficult to see clearly in the confusion of twilight. And the night of the transitory period stands before us with its nightmares, shadows, and horrors. But beyond it is the dawn of a, of a great culture that is waiting to greet the men of the future. So the moon, as a symbol, the moon illuminates the path of the revolutionaries that are willing to walk during this age of uh, looming darkness. We also have this concept of organic organotechnics or what we call organic mindset, which is, the, um, which is about uh, uh, multiplicities, for example, the way evolution happens, you know, the way that it, it's in popular science is conceptualized is as 
uh, a continual optimization towards a target. The actual evolutionary process in the, in the fossil record, in, um, when we observe it empirically, doesn't actually happen like that. It happened in terms of uh, speciation, divergences, selection on those different tribes or communities or cultures. So this is the holistic thinking, and, this, and, and not only that evolutionary process doesn't happen purely at the level of individuals. It can happen on the level of, of, of an entire tribe or an entire community or an entire species. So when we think about uh, technology, this is how we think about technology and conceptualize it in the, the period we're in, in the context we're in, what environments we're operating in. And we see it's reflecting in our software design philosophy. So currently, the, the dominant philosophy of technology is megatechnics. And you see that, for example, the crappy Silicon Valley uh, apps or products that, uh, that are made just to harvest people's data. You know, uh, the obsession with making sales, with doing marketing, with products that become obsolete after, after a period of time. Product, like the products are, aren't meant to serve the society or to serve users. And this is the difference with Linux. The Linux philosophy is that Linux is, uh, you, there's no company that's providing support for Linux. It's other people that provide support for Linux. But Linux give us the power to create infrastructure. It allows us to create, uh, allow groups of people to work together. Whereas, whereas a product like an Apple or some other product, you, you, you can never modify that product. You can never create something bigger. You're always limited to what they give to you. Whereas, whereas the Linux philosophy is empowerment. And when we talk about nature, being nature-oriented, um, which and, and also uh, oriented around humanity, we're not talking about the number of trees, the number of plants, or the number of people. We're instead talking about uh, something internal, which is connected to autonomy, strength, uh, morality, You know, uh, having a society that's politicized. And when we talk about uh, uh, politics, we're talking about, we're, it's essentially we're saying that it's synonymous with direct democracy. That's why the nascent emerging uh, uh, space in terms of DAOs, DAOs, is, is very interesting in terms of how it allow communities of people, groups of people, to collectively pull capital together and to direct that capital. For example, we did the Assange DAO, and we were able to raise 55 million for Assange. Woo! Yeah. And, uh, and when we talk about dank net markets, what are we talking about? We're talking about the agorist market, about the actual free market, the democratic market. It's, it's actually the majority of the world's economic activity. It's generative, it's liberatory, it's, it's not uh, controlled or censored. Uh, agorism. Uh, briefly about agorism, what is it? It's a very influential ideology from the, the, the birth of Bitcoin in 2010, 2011, which somehow has, has ended up being airbrushed out of crypto history entirely. Uh, but a lot of the early Bitcoiners were agorists, including Ross Ulbricht, who founded the Silk Road. And on the Silk Road, there would be manifestos and reading groups by Dread Pirate Roberts. Uh, discussing agorism, and the favorite uh, book of Ross Ulbricht was a novel called Alongside Night, which is about a, a group of revolutionary uh, uh, agorists in the US who use markets, who use the power of uh, 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 free trade to overthrow the US government. So that's what agorism is about. It's a revolutionary ideology about how we can use markets and economy to reclaim our power from the state. Okay, so I mentioned as well the looming regulation into crypto, and I talked to us about the pumpy narratives at the height of the bull market and all these pumpy projects. And the thing is, is a lot of those guys are going like mass adoption, institutions, onboarding, blah, blah. And the thing is, is that kind of narrative, as soon as the state hit back and go like, okay, regulation, uh, it, 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 it kind of shatters the illusion of, um, of, 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 you know, the kind of, of that narrative going, hey, support us in this drive to get the crypto space regulation regulated because it will help get crypto adopted 
as soon as like the state turned against crypto and actually go, no, come here, motherfucker, uh, then it, it shatters that narrative, and that's a kind of, that's an example of what's called a fragile narrative, as opposed to the extreme the extremist side, who's like, no, they are our enemy fundamentally. There's like irreconcilable differences between crypto and the nation state and state civilization. There's no reconciling this. You know, as I said, with the stable coins, we're inflating the, the one power that the Fed has is to allocate credit, is to print dollars and allocate in the community. And now in crypto, we have a means to print our own money. And we're doing we're like debasing the fiat currency with impunity. So that's a huge danger for them. But not only that, anonymity, you know, underground markets, all of that kind of stuff, they don't like it. So the thing is, the more the state crack down on us, the more it reinforce our narrative. The more we say, look, that's what we say was happening. And, the, and then the more it, it invigorates uh, the community to, to go more in a crypto-anarchist direction, and the more it, it and then the more it, um, it, the more the state tries to crack down on us, and it's a self-reinforcing feedback loop. The same way all, all throughout history, revolutions happened. The revolutionaries were a small group of people. You know, then <coughs> when um, when things start to go go against the mainstream narrative, then uh, they they were able to ascend to power because um, because uh, they exist in this this like. Uh, how do you say this? Like race to the, uh, to, they like it exist in a feedback loop together. So that's an example of an anti-fragile uh, narrative. Okay, so I, uh, so also I talked about so that's about the the regulatory or legal kind of environment around crypto. The, I, there's also the technological aspect. So there's new, I talked about there's a new paradigm of anonymous engineering. So what is anonymous engineering? So well, here's an example uh, of uh, software engineering, cryptography engineering, financial engineering. And how are these different? So software engineering is I write some code, and that code gets compiled, and it gets run in the CPU on my computer, and it operates the computer to do something. Financial engineering is, you know, like, oh, how do I design the incentive schemes to create a derivatives market or to create some AMM or like, so that the, this infrastructure that I'm provisioning have the actual expected behavior. How do I engineer the, the, the system of incentives and disincentives and tokens or whatever to, uh, to uh, create that desired outcome? So... And lastly, cryptography engineering. What is cryptography engineering? It's like, okay, uh, you know, my I want to create a system with public keys and private keys. Like, how do I exploit algebra or mathematics to uh, create that public uh, system with public key and private key, or create signatures or a hash function, etc. So, designing a hash function is an example of cryptography engineering. So anonymous engineering, what, what is that? Well, anonymous engineering is concerned with how do we compose these cryptography primitives? You have hash functions, you have signatures, public keys, you know, you have uh, zero knowledge proofs, you have VRFs, you have uh, multi-party computation, you have homomorphic encryption. How do I assemble those techniques to build applications? And that's, that's essentially what we're going to talk about in our talk giving examples of applications that we can build. Uh, also, a very important uh, development in uh, anonymous engineering is the development of zero-knowledge techniques. So a zero-knowledge smart contract is very different to the classical knowledge uh, of smart contracts. And in fact, like designing, engineering, designing um, uh, anonymous layer one there's a lot of established knowledge out there about consensus protocols, about smart contracts, about token engineering, etc. Uh, but trying to design anonymous L1, we have we have to kind of revisit all that research from the ground up to to uh, to re redesign it with the assumption of privacy at the core. So, in terms of smart contracts, um, if anybody's written a smart contract, even on Bitcoin, 
you have this script or you, you have this smart contract with functions and when you deploy a smart contract, everybody on the network execute the functions. And if the function gets executed and passes, then the state is allowed to go to the next thing. So this gets accepted into a block as a valid transaction. So the anonymous paradigm is different. So in a ZK context, because I have anonymous data, and I'm not sharing this data with anyone else, this data about you know, uh, my activity or, or, or my balance or the coins I hold or you know, my position on an exchange, whether I'm long or short or the volume, etc. Uh, I can't share that information so people can't verify that transaction. So there is a distinction between the prover and the verifier. There's some data or secrets that I have, and I prove a statement about it, and I give the proof to the network, and the network does a verification of this proof. So for example, if you have a forum, which is anonymous, oh sorry, uh, this is meant to say DAO. I had a different example, I changed it, but let's say anonymous DAO. In order to stop spammers, maybe we mandate that anybody that wants to put a proposal that can be voted on in the DAO has to possess in their wallet the minimum number of governance tokens. So there would be some kind of check, which is the number of governance tokens that I have is less than the proposal limit, which is set in the DAO. So, you know, I don't want to reveal how many uh, governance tokens I have in my wallet, but I can give a proof that uh, the, the, the wallets that I possess, even though it's not public, is more than this limit that's set in the DAO, which also does not need to be public either. But people then <coughs> take that statement and they can see that it's valid, it's enforced by cryptographic truth. So the verifier, he cannot see the attributes, but he accepts the, state is, the statement is true, and therefore the state is modified, the proposal becomes live, and the operation can continue. So I'm just going to give some example of like creating a, a smart contract, how I show in practice. So you see here, this is a very simple proof, which is constructing a Pedersen commitment of some secret values. And it just says that, you know, um, you know there, that I have some value and um, here I multiply it by an elliptic curve point, I have a blinding factor, multiply that, add them together to get the Pedersen commitment, get the X and Y of the Pedersen commitment, uh, reveal them, reveal that encrypted, uh, reveal that encrypted uh, homomorphic hash of the value there. And these are the secret values that go in to the contract, like that. So. And then when I want to load it into my program, you know, um, what I will do is I will take that contract and I will compile it to some kind of binary code. And then uh, the person who's making the proof will create this uh, array of witnesses. And then they will uh, pass these values into this function that says create the proof. And now they've got a zero knowledge proof. And then when the verifier wants to verify it, all they need to do is take the proof, take the public values that are part of that contract, uh, and also the compiled, what we call the compiled circuit or the binary code. And then they just call this function proof.verify, and either it passes or it fails. Um, but then uh, if this, this, should, this returns a boolean. Okay. <coughs> So here's the compiler, that's the help text. If I run um, dash i, here is an uh, interactive um, simulation of what happens to the virtual machine underneath. So the, 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 the code, when you compile it, will get translated to a bunch of algebraic statements 
that will be loaded by, the ver by a machine underneath. And then that machine uses it to build a table which goes into the cryptographic algorithm that constructs the zero knowledge proof. So this is, this is what will be happening uh, when that binary code is, is, is loaded into the, into the program. So that's all the commands running. And then uh, also when you compile the bytecode, this is essentially the structure of the binary file that exists. So you see there's like different, there's different sections. There's a section, the constants, a section with the secret <coughs> witness values that go in, and then a bunch of statements. And each statement is the, each like all of the function calls that were there. So when I want to compile it, I just need to run this. And you see it create that bin code that was loaded by the program. Uh, okay. So let's continue on. So how do we build a voting, a voting system? In a voting system, you have a group of people and then each of those people is, um, has, you have some way to verify they're part of the group of people who can vote. And we're about to start a new vote on something. So what we do is we issue everyone, or, or what, what people do is, is they submit to me a coin. So this is the mint step here. And, and you create a, a random serial number, it's like a private uh, randomly generated like serial number and then you create a hash of that serial number, an encrypted hash which is just like a commitment, you commit to that serial number but you don't reveal that serial number, you keep it private but you give something that later on you can prove that it had this serial number inside and no other serial number, like a box and so, you, you, and so this is the coin, a public coin and then I collect together all of these public coins and then, once I've collected the coins together, I put that into a set, a Merkel tree, like we have in Bitcoin, and then the voting begins. And then, for everybody to make a vote, they have to burn one of these coins. Once they've burned the coin, they can no longer go back. It's over. You submit the burned coin. And so the way that you do that now is you reveal the serial number, which, remember, in the previous step was private, but the coin was public, but here it's the other way around. The serial number is public, but the coin is private. So what you do is you derive the coin from the serial number, which you can only derive this coin from this serial number. You can't derive any other coin, especially given the blinding factor. And then you say, and this is what this statement says, is that this coin is in the set of all of the coins. And the way you do that is you do a Merkel hash. For those who are technical, you Merkel hash to the root, and you get this derived root, and then you just reveal, um, and, then, and then there's this public value, the Merkel root. This is the Merkel root of all of the coins, and you just check that they're both equal to each other. So essentially what you've said is that, you know, uh, this public serial number that I revealed, uh, that it corresponds to this coin value, which is in the set of all the valid coins in the Merkel tree of coins. Whereas in the previous step, the serial number was private. So that way you have a completely unlinkable uh, voting. You're able to make a vote, but there's no link between who voted for what. It's completely anonymous. Okay, that same scheme that you just had, you can, expect, you can extend it now for, for generic payments. So in this hash function here, where you hash the serial number and the blinds together, this one, you see here it's a hash of serial number and blind, you hear the same. You can actually add more attributes inside of that thing. So here, we extend it with attributes, and one of the attributes could be the value of the coin. So, you know, when you have a coin that's worth like 10, 10 Bitcoin or whatever, then you can split the bit, you can, you can burn a coin that's worth 10, and you can mint two coins, one worth two and one worth eight, but it's completely anonymous, the value is inside of the coin, it's encrypted, uh, but now I can give what the one that's two Bitcoin to someone, and I can put the one that's eight back in my wallet. So I can, you can fork, you can uh, join the coins together. And you can put other attributes in there, so for example, you can put a token ID if you want to have multiple different types of tokens on the same network, 
Uh, if you've got Bitcoin, you've got Monero, you've got ETH, you've got different coins, you know. Um, and that token ID is also anonymous, so nobody knows what type of the coins being moved around is, doesn't know the value, doesn't know who's sending to who, everything anonymous. And you can even add more advanced things like uh, use, uh, data that can be used by other ZK contracts uh, and spend hooks that allow other contracts. So for example, if you make a DAO, you want the DAO to be able to have a treasury, that treasury have money that can be managed by the DAO. So you can use these mechanisms to, con to construct uh, advanced contracts like that. <clears throat> so then that same, uh, that same design, you can use that to make anonymous swaps. This is just like a swap, which, you know, very basic, that we coordinate on Signal together. Say, hey, I want to trade my, uh, my Bitcoin for your Monero. And then we construct the transaction together, and then by pasting in strings of data or whatever. And then we get something at the end, that once we post it on chain, settles the transfer atomically, like swaps it done. And the way that you do that is just the same thing as before. Remember, we have the token ID in, in the coin. So, all, so these, you've got the value of the coin, you've got the token ID, and you've got a public key. All of this data is encrypted, but you can export these encrypted values in a deterministic way, so such that uh, you can then check, you add an extra rule to your state transition function. So you know in Bitcoin, there's blocks every 10 minutes. The blocks are filled with transactions. Well, the, trans the transactions are run in this state machine or state transition function to advance the state of the Bitcoin network to the next state. So essentially, for, for this type of transaction, which is a swap transaction, you just add a check and it says, this check says that, okay, uh, uh, this token ID on this output corresponds to this token ID, this value is also the same, but the key, the keys are swapped, the public keys are swapped. So that's an uh, atomic swap. So it's just an extension of the payment scheme now allow you to do uh, a swap. And then you can, so it's, it's for some reason blocked, but I can just, see, just do that. Uh, I guess it doesn't matter. Uh, you can chain all these uh, rules together. <coughs> yeah, it's only a little bit at the bottom. Maybe I'll just move it up quickly. So you can chain all these rules together to build uh, more advanced <coughs> things. So for example, here's a, uh, anonymous DAO. So anonymous DAO is essentially saying, uh, so essentially, remember before we talked about there's payments, and you can have token IDs in the payments. So then now you can have um, multiple tokens inside your network. And let's say we have um, a bunch. Of, let's say we have a, a, a token associated with like the, the money that's stored in the treasury of a DAO. Let's say it could be. Bitcoins and Moneros or whatever you want. And then you have a, gov a specific governance token used by the DAO to take governance decisions. So we showed how to do that earlier. And so somebody creates a new DAO with several attributes, minting it on the network. So proposal limit, quorum, approval ratio. And now you have this encrypted object in the blockchain. And people can send funds it to this encrypted object. So nobody else knows um, that it's being sent to this DAO, and they don't even know what the DAO is, except the people inside of the DAO. And uh, you know, they, when they send the funds, they use those extra fields that we talked about earlier to link it to the DAO. And so then somebody wants to make a proposal. And so then they have a certain number of governance tokens, and they say, OK, I have my governance tokens are bigger than the proposal limit that was set by the DAO. And so, um, and then the proposal contains a description or contains like some code inside of it that basically interpreted says, you know, if this proposal is accepted, transfer this amount of funds from the DAO treasury to this public key. And so then starts the voting phase, as we specified earlier. And after all these encrypted votes have been submitted and the voting period ends, then these, these, uh, there's a type of encryption, the, the, like the Pedersen encryption, which is what we call homomorphically additive. Then these are added together. And then uh, a proof of a successful vote, if the vote passed, is submitted to the blockchain. And then what it does is it unlocks 
a certain amount of funds in the Dow Treasury, uh, as, as specified by the proposal, that can be transferred to that key, that public key P. And all of this completely anonymous. So anyway, that's a, an in-depth uh, explanation of something complicated. You can also do, so, so um, as well, uh, even if you have limitations of creating anonymous, uh, anonymous engineering applications, you can still use other techniques like financial engineering to get around those limitations. So an interesting thing to think about is staking. If for, if for an epoch, like let's say there's an epoch of, I don't know, one week. In one week, the reward is uh, somebody, people who are staking on the network collectively, they will all be rewarded with 100 dark. But then the problem is, is that if I'm staking uh, 10 dark and some other guy stakes 20 dark and etc., then um, then to be able to the thing is is if the amount they're staking is anonymous, how do you know how to distribute that 100 dark reward to the people that are staking? You can't add up the total number of, of, of funds that are being staked because it's anonymous. So one way to get around this is if I stake 10 dark then I mint this intermediate currency that's one-to-one -one with the 10 uh, that I'm staking, like let's call it 10 IC or whatever. And, um, and, and so, you know, let's say there's, let's say collectively uh, there is 50 dark being staked, then in that epoch, that one week epoch, 50 IC would be created and then as opposed to trying to drop the reward directly on people, what you do is you have an AMM, and uh, one side of the AMM is this intermediate currency, <coughs> the other side of the AMM is, um, is the reward that's dropped in, the 100 docs. So anybody now, can, this intermediate currency is not worthless. Now it has a valuation, because you can put it into the AMM, and you can claim some part of the reward at a market value. So, because you don't know the, you can use market mechanisms as a way of distributing rewards to people, even though you don't know the positions everybody has. So um, also, uh, we built uh, because a lot of projects um, they use Discord and they use GitHub issues. They use these proprietary platforms, which we feel is counter to our ideology and philosophy. We built our own, and we are building our own decentralized alternatives to this infrastructure. So to start, we built our own, um, uh, where is it, oops. We built our own uh, anonymous chat, which is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, protocol. And you can connect any IRC client to a local daemon that connects this peer-to-peer -peer network, and you can communicate with uh, other people. I'll just show that. Do you see I'm, I'm starting that? And it's uh, doing the seeding process. Let me just check the internet. Okay. It's connected, so now I can start WeChat, which is an IRC client. And you see I'm connected to the network and I can chat with people. Hi, hi. You see, so there you go, anonymous chat. And you can see there's people chatting there all day long, every day. This is where we do all of our development coordination, and you have multiple channels, memes, philosophy, markets, math, randoms, etc. All right. Also, this one's this tool is more in, in still under <coughs> development. We build our own. Uh, decentralized uh, task manager because we don't want to use GitHub either, which is owned by Microsoft. So you see that there's some tasks, and if I type uh, info two, you see it will, it will show me that. And you see the tasks; they have a title, they have a description. You can start, uh, you can pause them, you can stop them when you complete them. Also, people can uh, make comments on them, etc. So 
sorry. And, and so that's, you see, it's, it's only got fake tasks there because we're still testing it and, and so on. Uh, and then now, this month or next month, we're going to release the demo of the DAO. We have a, a, a DevNet, uh, not yet a testnet, but we're moving towards a testnet. And then, uh, also, and then we're going to make swaps, just the very basic swaps. And then after that, go on to more advanced types of markets and so on. So anyway, to finish the talk, if you're interested uh, to know more about this uh, thesis I talked about with the, the fragile, anti-fragile narratives and the new phase of the crypto market that we're moving into, which is also the bull, bull case for Monero as a cryptocurrency, which has wide adoption uh, on the Danknet markets which what my lawyer told me to say. Uh, go um, find this article on e-girl capital, Luna Punk, and the dark side of the cycle. It's a dark cycle thesis. Thank you, guys. Because building anything is, is, is very, very hard, right? So building cyberpunk, cyberpunk systems or cyberpunk systems is, is next level hard. But building cyberpunk systems with cyberpunk tools is, in my opinion, impossibility. So I, I see you guys really like to use really well to use those those stand for all your principles but can you get things done yeah i think uh, most of the software being made in the crypto industry is absolute dog shit because it's influenced by like silicon valley sjw retard mindset so we build software that's like from linux fundamentals but we don't put extra stuff in the code because we want more features Try to build things like simple, like clean, you know, direct and like, you see, we, there's no GUI set, it's all terminal, you know, right? We don't care about normies, we're building the stuff that we want. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I, you know, you showed the smart contract for, um, you know, something simple like a Peterson commitment. Um, now, I, I did a little bit of smart contract development on, you know, Bitcoin scripts and so forth, which is, you know, re very simple. Like, do you think it'll be a big challenge for developers to um, move their infrastructure over to, um, you know, circuit development? Um, like, I'm especially worried about, because um, it's very easy to debug a Bitcoin script, but, you know, like, if it's, uh, if you have, like, a zero knowledge proof, then it kind of seems like a you know, dark hole where, okay, you know, how, how, how do I know where you know, something went wrong and so forth? Do you, do you think there could be like a uh, problem of like getting developers to build really like reliable smart contracts uh, that way? Yeah, it's, it's exactly correct. And that's why I oh, have yeah, my keyboard. This is the bear market laptop. It's, the keyboard is broken. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I was using another keyboard. But there, um, okay, maybe I can just quickly show that slide again because it was important. But uh, the the Z, the ZK uh, is is so a lot of the people writing uh, ZK contract languages now they're um, 
they're, uh, they they learned the wrong lesson from the from the the eighties and the seventies, which at the time Lisp was like the big dominant language. All the academia was like, oh, Lisp is theoretically more perfect and pure. And then there were a group of guys that made C, a very small group of guys, and they ended up winning, and all the other stuff like never took off. They were even building processors based off of Lisp. So a lot of programmers today, who are especially people building the ZK contract languages, they, run, they, they took the wrong lesson from that history, which is that C is better. The imperative design is better. Actually, the reason why C won out over Lisp is because C is, is less abstracted from the hardware. It's like closer to what the programmers are actually working with in the machine. So a lot of the paradigm that people are building with ZK now is based around imperative style. However, fun, this is my point with this slide, is that anonymous engineering is fundamentally algebraic. So it's a completely different paradigm. And, yeah, and if you look at our language that we have, it's very basic. It doesn't even have functions. It doesn't have macros or anything. The reason why we, we, we deliberately create a language that's very simple is we don't want to trap ourselves. Uh, back ourselves into a corner where as we advance along creating applications, we realize that we chose the wrong abstractions. So it's still very early, very nascent. In fact, the ZK algorithms are, are liable to substantially change. There's a lot of new interesting research on uh, new primitives that can be exposed and optimizations, like how you look up tables, etc. So it's, it's completely correct that the, the abstractions that we, that we have to do with ZK is still very, it still has, we're not there yet. There's a long way to go. That will happen through building applications naturally in a feedback loop. That's how abstraction always works in computer science. The other aspect um, about it being a black hole is why it's very, that's why I showed the, the, um, the interpreter, which is showing like the commands are being run. So having debug tooling and uh, very good tooling is, is really key for working with this stuff because it is building a circuit. Like at some point, something goes wrong, and a lot of programmers I worked with were like, "Oh, why doesn't this work?" And they were doing something uh, really, really bad. But so it's quite complicated right now to build contracts. But I'm I'm building contracts as because I'm an expert. But as we get better, we will develop better abstractions, and the programmers who are not experts will also be able to build applications. So a, a question for you, Amir. Uh, thank you for doing this. I, I believe this is this is great, and I, I believe uh, I, I remember one of your early Bitcoin conferences, and I feel the same spirit uh, always with you. So thank you. And the question is. <laughs> so the question is, how do you finance the operations right now, and how regular people like us, how we can join support, and is there going to be like a token sale for Darkfi, or what's going to happen? Uh, we're a decentralized community, so um, that will be voted on by the community decided. But about how well, how people can help, you know, we have that IRC. People should get in the IRC. It's completely fun. It's politically incorrect. Uh, you can change your nickname to whatever you want, whenever you want, and uh, you can also help provision infrastructure. Like we need. Uh, people to set up seed nodes, maybe even set up bridges, etc. So that's different ways people can help. And also, um, the, we have also uh, our philosophy or ideology. So we have those re study groups, reading groups that we encourage people to participate in. Oh, that sounds amazing. <coughs> my question, like how someone like myself could also participate or like actually engage in your amazing <laughs> project um, because I, I can just watch you um, yeah the fascination but not really understanding much yeah um, but like for example this anonymous like peer-to-peer um, -peer communication effort that you're building would be extremely interesting actually for every one of us right so is there like a form of also me not having a Linux computer yet being very familiar with like the whole other am I able to still communicate over this tool or yeah, are you planning on like a rather easy UI? <laughs> yeah, so the whole point is we don't want to be a centralized community. So there will be different teams mm -hmm. and other teams making products or maybe other teams making like UIs or front ends. But for that chat, 
there's a public instance which people can connect with any uh, there's different IRC websites like Mibit or something. You can connect to the public instance and then join the chat. And then what I recommend is to install Linux, learn about the fundamentals of using Linux, about the command line, and then also like uh, uh, in downloading and installing uh, applications, compiling them. Because to, if you use Linux, it will make you more empowered as a user and yeah. also deepen your perspective in, in terms of crypto. I encourage everybody to start with a Linux distribution. I don't know what's good, Ubuntu, I guess. Yeah. Um, a question uh, is actually for both, both of you. Um, like when, when we see the, the, the hardware attacks and, and supply chain attacks mainly, uh, is there a way to, with software, like check if there's been any additional uh, hardware attached, like, like, like a hash with software, but with hardware that we can check these supply chains? Because I think that's it's one of my biggest fears of you know, like ordering hardware wallets and things is, is that supply chain attack. Uh, I think the short answer is no. I think there, there's never a software that can check hardware. That's, uh, I, I don't know how, how, how you could do something like that. If the hardware is manipulated, there could be a perfectly fine software running on it, but the hardware does something else, and the software has no way to figure out that the hardware does something else. Um, I mean, hardware is something physical, so you need to think about physical security. So maybe you have a case that is especially closed. I mean, hardware what is already does that. They are, they are like sealed, that they are not easily open and change something uh, while, while it's uh, sent to you. And they are like tricky things that, for example, one funny thing is you have like small, um, colorful, uh, like how is it called, so small, colorful uh, flakes and you put it in a uh, epoxy and put that and seal your hardware wallet with that and then make a picture and then send it out and that is something that is not reproducible because the flakes with the colors are never you, you can't arrange them exactly the same that's one example but you need some physical security to secure hardware there's no we can't have measure electrons around and say oh, it took longer this time, so they're not they're talking extra. The, the software has no conception of time, so there's the first problem. Even if something takes longer, software never can figure out that uh, it took longer. I mean, it's simply not possible that software verifies uh, hardware. I, not to my knowledge. Maybe you have an idea. <laughs> 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 okay, more questions? Well, I mean, I would have a question for Amir. Like, you started off your, um, your presentation with the um, gods and like ancient, um, well, gods, let's say. Um, um, where do you see, where do you see this, like, whole... Yeah, this whole ride going. Like, what's your prediction to, on that? Like, for the next, let's say, I don't know, five to ten years or so, in regards, like, really, like, let's go in like this rather energetic old uh, fields, I believe, because from my point of view, it's rather like what we are seeing right now over the past, well, starting two thousand years ago, let's say, it's like those cycles, and we are ending a cycle. And like, what's your personal prediction in regards of like the sun god in particular and the moon god? Because um, I'm, I'm curious about this Munga theory of yours. Yeah, so everybody that I, I talk to um, kind of feels, and it's like universal, that within the next five years or so, there's going to be a major, you know, macroeconomic or political event or maybe multiple of, of, of some significance. So, um, during the COVID, uh, I watched so much sci-fi. I watched all of the sci-fi that probably exists, or most, the vast majority of it. And the interesting thing is that the sci-fi from the 90s, you know, it's very, there's always like, you know, there's a society and everybody's uh, chilling and then bam, something from the unknown comes. Godzilla, you know, uh, tsunami, 
uh, aliens blowing up the White House, you know, um, the, the other. And then what happened in 2001? The Twin Towers collapsed. It was almost like we memed it into existence. And like Al Qaeda were like, huh, that's a fucking good idea. Like, it's a really good marketing thing. And, and it works for them, you know, fair play. But um, when you look at the sci fi that's come out over the last uh, two years or so, the contemporary sci fi, very brooding. It's post, post apocalyptic. You know, there's, there's, um, it's a dystopia. And that is reflective of the general mindset that exists within society, that people collectively <coughs> get. So we're, and, and it goes without saying that the economy is on this runaway effect where it has been happening for the last five, ten, maybe even longer years, where people are really like going, this is not sustainable, it's, it has to crash this year. And then, you know, it's like the Bitcoin, like the crypto price, you zoom out and it's parabolic. You know, like, can't go any higher, and then you zoom out, oh yeah, it did, you know. So it's like, it's, it's, we all know collectively where, where it's heading. And the consequence of that, you know, is a huge amount of human suffering. It's like unavoidable that uh, conflict is a part of that shift, as we shift away from the US centered financial empire. Would you even say that this is corrected to the sacrifices to survive, probably? Uh, well, like we, like it's, it's, it's actually a fact that there's paedophiles in the government. Like in the, in the UK, there's actually like, and then there's something about human beings that when we see uh, powerful, like people that are like too powerful, mm -hmm. the, the, there's something like disgust inside of us because it's like, we kind of like absolute power over other human beings. It, it, it make people like twist it. It like, it create perversions. As a consequence of like the system of power that we have is create perversion. Like for example, Hunter Biden, the yeah. son of Joe Biden's emails were leaked. One of the screenshots of the chat with his dad, yeah. he's fucking a hooker. Like who the fuck sends a picture of themselves having sex with a hooker to their dad? Something really weird and perverted about the the, up, the upper class liberals, they're in charge, you know, the people from the deep state, the, the purport to, and even the campaign manager for Hillary Clinton, which is uh, uh, John Podesta and Tony Podesta, he has literally art uh, of, uh, he, in, in the main hall of his house, he has a gold statue of a childless head, a child, uh, headless child bent over backwards, which is a serial killer in the US who used to cut off the heads of children and pose them in that. He has a statue of that shit in his house. In his office, he has pictures of, of children that are laying down on the floor like they've been raped. And this artist, she just does those pictures. You look at the Hollywood celebrities, they have, they have uh, dinners or gatherings where they have, they have like a cake of a, dead, of a dead naked woman laying flat and they cut it up and they're all dressed in white robes. Something very wrong that's gone with the morality of the people that are in charge of society. They don't care about the plebes. They're out to extract wealth from society. And, and not only that, now, China, when we brought China into the WEF uh, uh, in the 90s, we are like, oh, you know, China, they'd become more like us. It didn't happen. China just kept doing China things. And in fact, now, in the, in, in the West, they're, they're talking about CBDCs. What is CBDCs? It's the same as the social credit scoring system. They're like, oh, we can incentivize people. Like the, 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 the reason Germany had such big success after World War II is because they built their economy around Spark Eisen, local community banks, cooperatives, decentralized uh, financial infrastructure. But the EU system is actually based off of the fa earlier failed Reichstag Bank. And, uh, and now that, that financial infrastructure, which has been centralized into a few high street banks, they're now talking about CBDCs, which essentially just is a website of the European Central Bank. It should be absolutely horrible. Like everybody will have just an account at the, at the central bank, and they'll be, and they will, and the re, and, and they're inspired by the Chinese model. They want to implement the social credit scoring. That's what CBDCs are, and they're trying to outlaw cash by giving people incentives to exchange the cash for CBDCs. Not only that. Uh, uh, now, the, uh, Turkey in particular has pioneered a new form of, of warfare involving drones. These drones, they're very cheap to manufacture, 
Um, they spent hours in the sky, just hovering in circles, spending upwards of 10 hours. And, and when you know one of them needs to return, they just send another one to replace it. And they just look at one place in the ground, and the, the operator has a still image with thermals, optics, infrared, everything. You know, you can see everything that happens on the ground, and, and it's all automated with AI. So whenever something comes, the, the drone will eliminate that target. You can fill the sky with these drones, just completely surveying all the ground, stopping all human movement. Not only that, the US has, has um, I only saw it for the first time three months ago, they're using it in Syria against uh, uh, Al-Qaeda people. So it's called a ninja missile. It's a missile that when it, it doesn't explode upon impact, it shoots ninja swords at a target. It can eliminate a single individual human target with no collateral damage. The picture of it was a car where there was a hole in the roof where the driver was sitting. Around the car was body parts, like bits of fingers and, and blood and shit. That's fucking terrifying. They're developing automated weapons at scale driven by AI system of CBDCs, like fully dystopian environment. The only the hedge that we have against that is cryptography going dark. And this is what this is what the analogy of the desert is about. The, the system of surveillance seek to turn everything into a desert where it can see and surveil and observe everything. When England colonized Ireland, the first thing they did was to, to chop down all the trees so the gorillas had nowhere to hide. You know, the, the, the state opposes, um, this is what we mean by the dark forest. In the internet, we have to use cryptography to create these dark zones, dark spaces, where the cyber gorilla can, can hide, can move, like undeterred by the nation state.
muscle kind of system of morals or system of mechanism. Whereas the other tendency, it's like, it's, it's literally just like, you know, there is a benefit to you. This benefit is that you can remain free, that, uh, that um, you can aggregate, you can create, you don't have to pay taxes, you can move money around unrestricted. That's a very va powerful value proposition. And it doesn't, it doesn't require like a certain uh, uh, unification of a body of people for that to work. But also uh, about the criminal, what Nietzsche said about the criminal is that he is, um, it is the, uh, a natural form of, of, of human, which he is being driven insane by, um, by, the, by the morals of the, of the state that he lives in, which outlaws uh, all, of his, uh, instinct, all of his instincts and natural actions, and that everything that he has to do is with like, extreme caution and uh, remaining hidden. They create like mental disturbances in in the person himself. So, I actually think the criminals are the are the ones in the in the state in the government. You know, they're the they're the they like literally like literally two million people are murdered in the Middle East for nothing just to maintain a standard of living in the West. Yeah, it's like really gross. Like Tony Blair, like he keeps he, every so often he pops up in the Telegraph with his opinion on something. Why is that guy like still around? He, I like I was shocked recently because just quietly, it turns out earlier this year he was knighted by the Queen. The Queen knighted him, and he's like, and then he pops up at this FTX conference in in Bahamas. So it turns out that Tony Blair is like an agent of the state. He's not a guy that is like being shunned from politics because. He did something so disgusting, which for anybody who's not from the UK, what he did is he, f he falsified evidence. Like he, they created fake reports uh, that they used to justify the war in Iraq, and then the nuclear scientists, who, yeah, the nuclear scientists who wrote those reports, Dr. David Kelly, he came out and he said the reports were fake, and then he turned up two days later in the forest commit suicide by slitting his wrists. That's like the level that these states are operating in. The US, literally, because there's laws against torture in their own territory, they just ship people to Egypt, and then they put these people in boxes. They slowly uh, just make smaller and smaller, and their bones crack and shit, and they leave them in there for hours and hours. So it's like, oh, we don't do torture in the West, but we do actually do torture. You know, it's like things have got like so bad in the West. The real criminals, the ones that run the state. It's not the little mafias and gangsters. But we've discovered those things because they've become transparent. So that's what I'm saying. You know, if you try and create something that's too private, you know, we wouldn't actually know about any of those crimes because they'd be hidden from us. I, yeah, I, I don't know about that. The BBC doesn't really report on a lot of this stuff. Like, the BBC pretends to be objective and neutral and, you know, has an agenda. I don't really, nobody believes the media anymore. Everyone distrusts it. We do. Because they do. You know what they do in the UK? They have Tavistock Institute, which is literally Tavistock Institute. They use psychological manipulation and protest movements. And they're like a fake government charity. And they, the governments have engaged in all this manipulation, which they call perception management of people, so much just to, to stay in power, to, to, to like temporarily gain power. Uh, that now everybody's like, oh, they just lie to us. Everything they say is lies. Like, for example, I remember seeing a talk of Obama, and I was like, yeah, that's fucking, yeah, I agree, yeah. And then after I went away, I was like, wait, what the fuck did he actually say? He didn't say anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just knows yeah, how to talk. Yeah, yeah. That's the training that they do, yeah, sophistry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, everybody knows that that's how the politics operate. That's why, that's why they played a dangerous game. And it's got to the point where they no longer have the trust of people. Nobody trusts the system. But That's why it's like about falling that apart. Like, like, like in, in, in England, yeah, Julian yeah. Assange in prison. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and 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 not only that, uh, in England now, in England we used to have happy slapping, which is like, oh, it started out funny, like, oh, give someone a tap in the face and film them, but then gradually it became more extreme, like, oh, you slap them hard, oh, you punch them in the head. It's like, for people who don't know, happy slapping was a craze a few years ago when I was a teenager. Where you'd film a random person in the street, and somebody would come and hit them in the face, and it just became more extreme over time. You know, I remember being back in 2017 in England, and the, the latest thing was uh, 
people spraying acid on people's faces. Jesus. Like, and the people doing copycats of that. It's like, how far has, like, things gone, like, in the UK? Yeah. Like, you just go in the UK, there's, like, streets I know if I walk down at 7 p.m., somebody go, oh, what are you looking at, mate? Oh, I'm not looking at anything. Oh, you're calling me a liar. You know, whereas, like, in Syria, I can walk about 1 a.m. In the, in, in the night time, and nobody will bother me. I feel perfectly safe. Like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. something's seriously wrong. Highest rate of stabbings in the Western world. I like, literally got, like, neighborhoods you can't even go into, like... England's really, really messed up. Europe is, is, is a lot less along that trajectory, you know, but England's a good signal of, like, the, the destiny of, like, the liberal so system. So why is greater privacy? Uh, because the state wants to eliminate us. They're, like, giving more powers to the police. And the thing is, but the police... Is that power? The yeah. state, the government. The government, it's the fact that they can create their own money. Well, also creating their own money as well. But the, the police in England, they have, uh, for example, they can detain you for 72 hours without seeing your lawyer. They can conduct interviews with you where you're not allowed to say no comment. It's incriminating. And um, also um, compel you to decrypt your devices and so on. And the thing is, is those powers that you give to the police, it's not just the, oh, you know, we're giving powers to the police, but it's also... When the police have more powers, they can they can they become politicized. The police can target specific people. They can make decisions about who they're going to try and put in prison, who they're not going to try and put in prison, and that leads to authoritarianism. And and in general, in the Western world, we're seeing a very, as I said, with China. China has created a perfect uh, nation-state system, and now a lot of people in, in Europe and in the West, they're they're getting inspired by that model. And it's partly because... No, it's because now the social fabric is unraveling and the state has doesn't really have a way to keep control because the techniques of manipulation they've used are like losing their effectiveness. And so the danger is, is that, uh, that it's going to become more prohibitive for people that want to attain their freedom in the future. They're going to use that and no, make no mistake, like crypto is... Not the mafias, and, and certainly not the people in the government. The people in the government, they protect those people. That's like Tony Blair, for example. He's an agent of the Queen. Like, that guy's disgusting. Like, it tells you something about their morality. But we only know about these crimes because of investigative journalists who were allowed to be transparent. Mm, no. Really, no, it doesn't really And also, like, the risk, Victoria, I think, like, the risk of, like, actually, like, I mean, if we have, okay, everything is absolutely transparent, then everyone is absolutely, everything and everything is absolutely transparent. So I think the risk of having some, like, I, I think it's the outrage, yeah? Like, I mean, I think it's, like, creating something that's, like, private and allows for privacy for people like us is, like, worth more than the risk of having also some criminals in that other than the other than but I think one, one, of the, one of the issues I see is this comes with the communities and it goes on a little bit from Victoria and what you were saying was that when you go from a community and you ban a whole bunch of people, let's say, and you say, screw this, we're creating our own thing, you get these echo chambers of extremism uh, heading in there and then it's very hard to make that grow beyond that uh, because you get like maybe, uh, you know, black power or white power or some sort of extreme is you know, sort of outlawed over here and there. And that, and what 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 do you think, uh, Mia, with uh, when, with you want dark, to take a Josh last question? Yeah, yeah. last question with uh, with dark markets that you attract one type of extremism. And, it's good. And it be, I want it. Yeah. Okay. Like it's going to happen either way. People like it, don't like it too bad. Like we're going to make all of these tools. We're going to create these communities. Something's going to be unleashed, the likes of which we haven't seen. You know, and it will signal a new phase or a new era, and, uh, lead, and and lead to the destruction of a nation state, which will allow new actors and new upstarts to get to become rooted. You know, we're seeing a big uh, 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 transfer of wealth. Crypto is like our, our gateway or our, our our lifeboat. It's like a big storm, and we just want to get from A to B. And and crypto is like that little lifeboat that we can use to go through the storm. All right, thank you, guys. Okay, so we're gonna have now our OG panel. So it's gonna be the last talk for the day and afterwards.
Mine was mine was also giving a workshop. Yeah. That's the energy. I see you, PC. <laughs> All the other panels that I moderate, please hold your questions till the end. I'll call on you. And uh, for all the people on the panel, uh, let's everyone's had the whole day. We're tired and stuff, and we have a lot of time, so keep your answers concise to the point. And uh, we'll have a very nice panel that's not boring and keeps everyone awake, and we get everyone's attention away from your phones. Put your phone away. Thank you very much. Uh, the first, um, since these people have been around a while, uh, I think that. Uh, you know, we had the topic earlier about scams, right? So uh, I was, we could just ask, um, ask everybody, uh, what's the biggest scam uh, that, you, that you got scammed at or that you're a friend of yours allegedly got scammed? And tell us about it and like a clear lesson learned by it. Uh, back in the day, there was a service called InstaWallet where you create instantly a wallet on a website and you just have to bookmark it. Oh, yeah, it. Insta wallet, yeah. Uh, and it just threw up the QR code and you said, oh, you bookmark the wallet. Cool. Uh, of course, that website disappeared then. <laughs> After a little while, that was very early on. And then, obviously, Mount Gox. Um, but I don't know if that was more just uh, total uh, just incompetence rather than just, uh, my butterfly lab. That was a friend. Got fucked over. Wait, what? Butterfly lab. Okay, uh, in my case, I, I think MT goes, but like you said, I don't know if it's really a scam or uh, incompetent. Uh, besides that, I don't have anything else to report. <laughs> I actually feel the same way. Mount Gox is definitely the, uh, it, it, it's, the jury's still out, we'll see, but uh, maybe we'll all get our money back. Yeah. Probably the biggest scam I was involved in is Mount Gox. Nint, thanks for coming. <laughs> Yeah, um, one of my friends got 100 Bitcoin scammed at my box and uh, he sold his claim for two Bitcoin. I, I told him to hold on, but he decided not to. Yeah, so a lot of people are talking about Mount Gox for, uh, you know what's, um, okay, a bonus question um, on the panel. Who knows what um, MT Gox stands for? <laughs> Magic the Gathering! Online exchange. Online exchange. So yeah, that. So yeah, that, I mean, it's not really. It's like yeah, incompetence. Basically, that's the so empty gox is the lesson. You know, not your keys, not your coins. Uh, use a cool wallet, right? Uh, and uh, maybe we could say NFTs actually scammed us in the beginning. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I want to say it comes full circle because in a way, Magic the Gathering represents you know collectibles and NFTs. And then uh, a guy from Rip that like started ended up starting Ripple and Stellar sold it, 
And probably it was like fucked up before he sold it or something. And then, you know, the guy running it, you know, did, and then one of the first rare Pepe's is, is, you know, at this moment in I am euphoric. So it's kind of like all, all together coming full circle. All right, yeah. So uh, since you guys are listening, I'm sure that you're thinking of some really good questions in the meantime to ask uh, the crypto OGs. But I have a question. I have a question. Um, we're at he, we're here at another conference, yet another conference. Um, I'm sure many some of you have been to more than one conference this year. Why are we here? What's the point of coming here? Why are we here? Why are we going from conference to conference? What's the point? We have our community. It's all about the community. We need to educate people. We need to bring community together. We need to build Bitcoin by building people together. Build a community. That's the first answer. Next answer. Someone said to me, what's the killer app for blockchain? And I said, conferences. <laughs> killer app for blockchain is conferences? Okay. For me, for me it's meeting new people and uh, looking at the cutting edge of crypto. Do, do the mic like a rapper. It does. Yeah. Okay, what was your answer again? So uh, for me, it's meeting new people and looking at the cutting edge of crypto. Looking at the cutting edge of crypto. Is this the cutting edge of crypto? What do you guys think? <laughs> we have consensus? Okay. What do you think? What's the point of coming to conference after conference? Well, advertising my product. <laughs> so, uh, okay, that's a good. That's a good. Okay, then we'll we'll uh, then we'll since we had we have a very good answer, and now you you win bonus time. Um, show your product and tell us what how you make money. Yep. <laughs> you should have come to my talk. It was yesterday. I'm sorry. It was oh, okay. in the morning, but uh, okay. That's the biggest anti-shill I've ever heard. That's like, it's like an NFT trophy, like the non-shill shill. Like, should have come to my talk. I'm not even going to say the name of my product. And I am not even talk about making money at all. And uh, there's no token sale. There's no anything. Yeah, right. Okay, now we're going to break it up. Who has a question? I'll take one question from the audience now. Instead of waiting to the end until you guys are already asleep, we can just do one question now. Who has a question? Damn, you guys are like really like on point. We've got this is the, so you got to think this is the cutting edge of crypto right here. You know, when moon. When moon. Okay, good. Okay, that's good. Okay, all right. Let's do. Let's it's do. Like that's cool. We can do. We can do like a price market kind of you know thing. So okay, uh, we talked about empty Gox. There is actually like a new empty Gox rumor. You know, like. Maybe the coins are coming, they have to be sold, or you know, these like headlines. It's kind of like the China ban headline that comes again every cycle. You know, the Menti Gox coins are moving and something court, and I got like weird letters in the mail from Japan and like all this stuff again, you know? So, um, do you think the Menti Gox rumors are priced in, or is it going to cause like another leg down, or? What do you think? Do you have any opinion about that, or, uh, or the, just the bear market in general? Nint, on the spot, go. Like a rapper, put yeah. it in your mouth. And it's Yeah, the there's like rumors it. like that they're gonna have to sell some coins or something. It's yeah, just like, right, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, not priced in. Not. not priced in, okay. I, uh, the biggest survey I've seen is that everyone's gonna hold the Bitcoin that they get back and sell the Bitcoin cash, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Definitely priced in, and I think they already sold a bunch of coins, but I'm not exactly sure. I have no idea, I don't care. <laughs> so this is, ladies and gentlemen, if you've been around for a few years, this is what happens. You just kind of say, I don't care, whatever. Do we have a question in the back? Okay, hold on, hold on, we'll get you the mic. Here we go, this is how you do it. This is just like how the old school talk shows were, like Donahue or whatever, they have to like, walk into the audience and give the mic to people. What's the most expensive transaction you've ever made? Okay, Let's say, uh, what's the most expensive transaction that allegedly a friend of yours ever made? <laughs> or that you heard about someone making allegedly? I don't know. Back, back in the day, we used to throw Bitcoin at each other uh, just like, you know, because it was... Uh, yeah, and it hurt. No, but uh, if you look back at it, you're like, oh, here! Dude, you gotta try this thing. It's Bitcoin, you know. Oh, I want to buy some weed. Oh yeah, here, here's five Bitcoin. Go, you know, and then they lose it, or, or they or they spend it, and they go, wow, that's really cool. Uh, these were expensive. Uh, looking back, or going to Room Seventy Seven, paying one point five Bitcoin for a beer, whatever. I don't know. Yeah. No, it probably wasn't that expensive, but you know, uh, it, it, over time it hurts, and this is where that huddle meme started getting stronger and stronger. 
Because in the beginning, but if it wasn't for people in the beginning actually moving and having some sort of velocity, I don't think the whole meme would have taken off because it needs velocity to get interest. And every time, if you're trying to convince someone about Bitcoin, if you didn't, uh, if you didn't send them some, that aha moment wouldn't happen. You go, no, no, and then they're like, oh, it's too complex, and how does it? You go here, yeah, boom, and it goes bling, and they're like, oh, I get it. And you're like, now send me half back or whatever. And uh, that's when the aha light bulb goes off. But that was the, a lot of those aha were very expensive. <laughs> All right, so we had a question from the we had a question from the audience. What was the allegedly the most expensive transaction that maybe a friend or someone you heard about do? Water flow up. No idea on that one, but I definitely can remember like what he's talking about going to like a Bitcoin conference and spending multiple bitcoins on a beer. Or uh, I mean, I remember at the first Miami Bitcoin conference. Uh, we had like a twenty thousand dollar bill that we tried to pay in Bitcoin, and it took them hours to figure out how it worked, and we couldn't get it to uh, in the end. I think we used a credit card, but uh, I don't know the largest bill, but definitely paid way too many Bitcoins for simple things like a beer. Well, I remember what a developer. So sometimes I got support requests from users. They gave me their master public key, and I can't see what's in their wallet, and I've seen wallets that. At incredible amounts. Uh, wow. I mean. Uh, and you're trustworthy enough not to do anything. It's a, it's a master public key, so there is no. Okay. I don't okay. have okay. access okay. to the money. But I, I can't. Okay. I can't okay. see. I, I can see. see amounts that today would be. Uh, yeah, in the hundreds of millions. Right. On. Yeah, I, I know someone that sent ten uh, Nakamoto Pepe's in one transaction. That's worth a lot, by the way. <laughs> Okay, do we have any other questions from the audience? We're doing quite, yes. Raspberry Blitz. Um, so if you can change one thing in Bitcoin, uh, or add a feature, or, or some characteristics, or something that you want to see better or something, what would it be? The community. <laughs> a change in Bitcoin? Change the community? The people. Change the people? <laughs> okay. Well, that was easy. <laughs> Okay, yeah. any, the food, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, upgrading your uh, hardware wallet, so it's like a half stack time. So it's a what? Half stack time, you know. You're upgrading your treasure. How's it going over there? Okay. Me? Uh, what would you like to change? I, I'd like to have, like, really tiny fees. <laughs> I would, I'd love it, and I think that's what Lightning Network does, yay! Okay, I'm going to make a serious answer. Yeah, good. I want a hard fork with a minor subsidy that is constant. So, well, constant, yeah. Con so constant block reward, you mean? That's it. Yeah, because I think uh, we're going to enter in an uncharted territory when the mining uh, subsidy goes down to zero and uh, they only have to rely on mining fees. Uh, we, I mean, it's very, it could be very dangerous for Bitcoin. We don't know if it works in these conditions. Uh, of course, uh, it's not a majority opinion that I have here and uh, it kills the, the 21 million cap. But um, yeah, I know it, it's probably not going to happen, but let's see what happens. I, I, I will uh, okay, advise the popcorn. Yeah, cool. Okay, a bonus question for the panel. Pay attention. Um, what uh, active uh, blockchain that is proof of work has a constant block reward right now? Anybody? I forgot their name, but there is, a, there is some of them. Uh, very good. Close. Very close answer. Anybody Anybody in the audience have an answer for the bonus? Wait, wait. Monero. Monero has a tail emission. Is it constant? No. It's not constant. I mean, every block the same. Anyone? Yes. The answer is Doge. Doge has, is a very, is, a, is really interesting, and it's been around a while. It's been around since 2014, and they, they had, it went down, 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 and then it just flat forever. Can we pull Twitter up You want to say, like Christian said. We are going to bring a Dutch guy to the moon. Here we go. Yeah, but uh, it's merch, uh, it's cross-merch with, sure. uh, with Litecoin, so yeah. even Dogecoin is, is, is providing a kind of a tail emission for Litecoin at one point. Oh, that, okay, yeah. That's like a cool concept, that's true, yeah. So, Doge will be around for a while because it's proof of work and it's merged mine with Litecoin and... And Elon likes it. And Elon likes it. 
and it has a funny logo that people really like for whatever reason, and yeah, it has a constant block. So I'm just saying that like there's a real world example of a blockchain that's live that people on Twitter were like, oh, I don't like Dogecoin, let's attack it. How much does it cost? I'm tired of Elon tweeting about it. But I don't think anyone just attacked it because it's actually annoying as fuck to attack a proof of work chain that has a lot of hash power and it just wasn't worth to do it probably. Otherwise people would do it. Anyway, thought that was good. Okay, we have another uh, great question. Okay, in the back, here we go. We're going, we're going to the back. Um, watch out here. Uh-oh. Gotta go through the jungle. All right, here we go. Wednesday, you, you get a card. You get a card. You get a card. So, yeah, I'd like to hear your opinions on, like, the nation-state adoption, like what's happening in El Salvador, if you think, like, this has any benefits or not. Great, great. Yeah, so why don't we just say, uh, Josh, tell us like one really good thing you think is happening in El Salvador and one really shitty thing. I mean, one really good thing is that they, they went with Bitcoin and rather than creating their own coin, so that's that's pretty cool. But real Bitcoin is the lightning of Bitcoin. Yeah, get the time, just a second. So, so it, 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 yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's totally... So uh, the, the problem I see that, that nation states holding Bitcoin can also be very dangerous because... It's very easy for a few, very few people in power to control the private keys and then hold the entire country to ransom for its uh, central banking. Um, and uh, whereas, you know, gold at least is this sort of physical big thing. It's hard to, you, can, you just can't steal vast amounts of gold because it's just too heavy. So um, I, I think there's problems there with nation states. I think companies uh, holding Bitcoin and balance sheets very good, uh, but that's as sort of big as it gets. Even even when you get to large uh, enterprise, uh, there's so much security that's needed um, that you can get too secure and fuck it up. Um, so what was one good thing and one bad thing, real quick? All right, sorry. Um, good, good thing is they, they, they didn't create their own coin. Was, they didn't create their own coin? The bad, bad thing? thing Bad thing is that they could hold the entire country at ransom by stealing everyone's Bitcoin. If, okay, uh, shit, wrecked. <laughs> yeah, I would say the same as Josh, but I've never been there, so that's it. Okay. We don't need governments involved in our crypto. Yeah. Okay, we don't need it. Or, so one bad, or, or so the or bad why? thing is that it's a nation state that's involved, and the good thing is? Zero. Boom, zero. Here to hear first, ladies and gentlemen. Mike Dupree said zero good things about El Salvador. Quote uh, it on Twitter. Sold them ATMs. So, yeah. Sold them ATMs. I made some money. Extract that wealth. Took them six months to pay. Six months to pay. I'm Should have charged happy. interest. I'm not an anarchist. I'm very happy to be in a nation state and to pay taxes. Oh, wow, we're getting a lot of good quotes from the panel here. <laughs> this is called the, uh, the Bitcoin OG panel. Um, you know, I don't care, I sold them ATMs. I'm really happy to live in a nation state and pay taxes. Ben? Lieberland. I mean, it, it brought some more press for Bitcoin, which is cool, but I have not been there either, so I can't say. I haven't been there either, so I can't say. Okay, uh, any other, another, another question from the audience. The audience questions are going good. Again, this is so-called, this is the so-called cutting edge of crypto here. Show us what you got. Anyone in the cutting edge from crypto have a question? No, no one has it. Going twice. Going once. Going twice. Sold. All right, we're going to have, okay, then we're going to have to say, um, what do you think, what country is going to adopt a uh, CBDC first, in your opinion? What's the most likely country to do it first? Michael Dupree has a strong opinion. Uh, it's all just fluff and nonsense. Uh, fluff and nonsense. They're, 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 Tell they're, us. They're, they're, sorry, I want to interrupt you real quick. Tell us um, in in uh, in his in his presentation what's a fluff um, stable coin? What do you mean by that fluff? Well, there's just nothing really backing it, and uh, that's fluff. Like, like the there's dollar. nothing yeah. backing like it. Like Luna was just fluff. Uh, was, <laughs> Luna was backing Terra. Uh, but uh, 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 yeah, the next. Country, did you say? Or? Yeah, the next country, yeah. Uh, Libreland. Yeah, Libreland. Libreland, okay. Yeah, like, like I said, like, I got into Bitcoin to get away from the nation states and to build uh, an alternative economic mechanism outside of the country. So I don't really care. It's open for everyone to take. So if, if you know, so I want to do it, that's cool. But, um, you know, good on you, whatever. I don't want the government involved in my money. Yeah. That's it. Nin, you want the government involved in your money? No. No? <laughs> no. I think that probably China 
the information. China? China first? What do you think? Opinion? No, no opinion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's okay. It's good. So then we can, what we can also learn from this panel is that um, you don't have to have an opinion about everything. You can just, you know, think of, that, that's, 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 a, that's a good way to go. And, you know, you just don't have to put your head and your hands and your energy and everything. And you, you, then you have the chance to become an OG and be on the next panel. Maybe. Okay, do we have any questions? I'm going to ask again from the cutting edge of crypto. Do we have any questions from the audience? No questions? Okay, now we have, now, this is when, no, we're not over, it's not over yet. You already asked a question, that's too much. Okay, so now we have, so now we're going to flip the script, and everyone from the panel can ask one clear question of the audience and see if we have anyone will answer it. It could be a trivia question, like, what is the name of the coin that Satoshi mentioned that's not Bitcoin? Or something like that. Or it could be like, what do you guys, what, why are we here? What's your, re what's your reason for being here? What do you want to change? Or are there any developers here? I need a developer. Could be anything like that. Go. <laughs> <laughs> no questions. Okay, John. Uh, uh, does does uh, DALI 2 um, cheapen human creativity? Dolly 2? Yeah. Oh, the, the, the AI. The AI. Is it cheap in what? Is it cheap in human creativity? Yes. No. Uh, it's cheap okay, in raise your hand and then you will get the mic and you have a, can have a clear answer. Okay. Clear, concise answer, please. Yeah. No, AI can't compete with human creativity because it needs human creativity to uh, program the software. Okay. Oh. Okay. Oh. Boom. Okay. You have a question in the back or another answer? No, no, no. Okay. Add to it. You're loud. All right, then. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so, uh, it creates new jobs because now you have people who are really good at putting input into a computer that can be more creative than even the best artists by prompting the computer correctly. So, there's a whole range of new jobs that have just been created by that. Yeah. I think I, I get that, but isn't that what we do now? Because when I do ten-finger typing, I'm prompting the computer to do stuff. Yeah, but the computer algorithms have just been invented that can produce. Yeah, something. I mean, I think it's, it's just like it's just like leveraged computer, in my opinion. But I don't know that's the way I look at it. You know, what I mean, you're doing, you're generating stuff anyway. You know. Yes. It's not yet cheapening uh, human creativity, but it will. And it is, especially when it comes to like Dolly, uh, it's, a, it's a graphic uh, design thing, and it's quite shocking what it can do already now. Uh, so it is a heavily contested market. Everybody wants to be a graphic designer or do something with media and stuff, and this is really targeting us at a, I mean, society in general, with a kind of dream. So I think that Dolly is gonna gonna have a massive impact because it, it hits us where we least expected it. At least it did with me when I first saw the pictures that it would produce. You can say, you can say it's absolutely wrong. I ha I can say that I haven't seen it exactly, but I think what happens if that becomes like the standard, all these like pictures that just keep coming that are the same, then they don't have as much value. They're not the same. They're not the I just think that more, I mean, this is my opinion, I think that just more human pictures that are just like a dot on the wall or like a picture of a Pepe or something, I don't know if it can do that really good, because that will just, that'll be, frightening. you know, frightening. Nin, do you have an opinion on this? No. I've got a question, though. Okay. Ask the audience a question. So my question is, with, with the privacy concerns, will Monero ever be, become more popular than Bitcoin? Will Monero ever be po more popular than Bitcoin? Anyone want to have an answer? Yes, sir. Uh, two, the two people. Both of you get to answer then. Go. Uh, so Monero solves some of the privacy concerns that uh, Amir hinted to earlier, and it has a tail emission. So these are two principles that it got correctly. Uh, it got correct when it was architected that Bitcoin may be failed up. Okay. That's a that's a cool. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Oh, you want the mic too, Kevin? Okay. There's no on-ramps and such for yeah, anonymous yeah. coins is the issue, yeah. so you'll never have the same uh, market. Okay, Mike, Mike says no way. Go for it. 
Um, I don't think it will become more popular than Bitcoin because I think sound money relies on transparency. Um, and ultimately, if you want something with honesty and integrity, you need an element of transparency. But what we want to do is we want to flip. At the moment, we've got a situation where the elites have privacy and the general public has transparency. We want the elites to have transparency and we want the general public, the weaker in society, to have more privacy. That's true. People with power, transparency, less privacy. A final word. Also, my never does not scale. Yeah, so, okay, everyone think of a final message that you want to say. Do you have a final message that you want to say? Do you want to show your business? Do you want to say, like, everyone, come to my party tonight? No, I, I agree with uh, what uh, Victoria just said about yeah. transparency. I think it's important to find the right balance, and both systems need to, to exist, I guess. So uh, transparency for the... People. Well, for, for the total amount of coin in circulation, because okay. if you have a, a sure. completely completely dark cryptocurrency and someone finds a flow uh, and is able to mint more coins, uh, nobody might realize that. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that most of the, I mean, the ones that exist, Monero and Zcash and so on, I think you can check the supply without, uh, you know, seeing anyone's transactions <laughs> or something. As far as I understand. Yeah, as far as you trust the crypto. That's true. That's totally correct. Okay, we're, at, we're coming to the end. Everyone is tired. It's been a long day. I appreciate everyone staying to the end of the conference. Um, now, while we have your attention, everyone um, give a round of applause for Chris. Okay, now, uh, final words of the day. Mike Dupree, go. Build community. Teach somebody about Bitcoin. Josh. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Chris. Amazing work, and, and all the team as well. You know, uh, really, it's uh, it's it's a labor of love. I know it's not a, a labor of massive profit. <laughs> so, so, yeah, profit. What's that? What is this going on? So yeah, I mean, uh, uh, thank you so much, and um, it was really, really always every year an amazing. Amazing, and I, I really get everybody. To, if you do it again, to tell you know, tell your friends to come here, not only about Bitcoin, because you know, it's people like Chris that put the effort in, put their own money on the line to make these events happen, and these meetups, and to put funky balloons on the wall and all the stuff. Uh, it all costs money, so uh, you know, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah. <laughs> donation link didn't work uh, for PTC, so in case you... That's so kind that. of you not to care about donation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, me, me also thanks to Chris and uh, on Gen Z. Uh, my final would be uh, buy Bitcoin and uh, keep communicating within the community. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And... Uh, um, People who want to, uh, who are interested in, in becoming developers and who are young, they, this is really what they should do. I mean, we need more developers. All right, you heard it here first. Crypto OG panel. Thanks a lot. This is Theo Goodman signing off. Have a nice day. Jump in the pool, I don't know, have a beer, enjoy yourself, and have a good time. And tonight there will be again dinner on the top. And tomorrow I will post a link on the Telegram group for the boat trip. And okay, that's it for you.